On this upcoming attractions episode, we got more talk about The Mandalorian, plus trailers for Chaos Walking, Tom and Jerry movie, brand new Godfather, and a whole lot more. Plus reviews for Fat Man and Freaky. Plus the NBF game. Come join us on this episode of Midnight Double Feature. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Upcoming Attractions here on Midnight Double Feature. We are here to help you guys get through the latest trailers and the latest movies uh, out currently, wherever you may be, whether it's either VOD or in theaters. I don't know. That whole world is kind of a bit of a blur at the moment. Matt, what's happening, man? What's cracking? Bit of this, a bit of that, man. I just got Miles Morales on PS4. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm loving it. I'm loving it so far. More, bit more of the same, but I, I love that last game so much. So, yeah, I think once I'm... Uh, I imagine you're probably done by now, right? Because you got on PS5 like about a week ago. I'll, I'll save my thoughts because uh, we're about to get into what we've been doing lately. I, I'll save my thoughts for that because, honestly, I haven't been doing anything lately but blank PlayStation 5. Right, because <laughs> that's I, I was, all I was, I've been doing. I was going to say, maybe once I finish the game, we can do a spoiler talk at some point. Oh yeah, I I think I think we definitely will. Um, let me just let me but just don't go spoil ahead and, anything uh, for me yet. <laughs> no, no, there's no spoilers going to be here, guys. Don't worry. Um, let me let me just get the obligated things out of the way. Social media, guys. Social media is everywhere. Follow us on our socials. The after party on Facebook at Minato Feature uh, for Instagram at MDF Pod for Twitter. Uh, if you want to buy some merch, head to MinatoFeature.com. That's also where you can head to our. Uh, I guess exclusive members only club called the Green Room. Head to patreon.com forward slash midnight double feature. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash midnight double feature to support the show, to help us keep the lights on here at midnight double feature. We are an independent podcast. We don't do any sponsorships, we don't do any advertising. The only thing that we do advertise and plug is ourselves because we have no dignity. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, man, let's get into today's show. Before we do get into our trailers, let's, you know, I kind of like this thing that we've been doing the last few episodes where we just kind of talk about, you know, us and what we've been doing, uh, you know, what we've been watching, what we've been playing, you know, what we've been reading. Uh, okay, look, PlayStation 5, we already started talking about it. I got one. I was lucky enough to get one. I Honestly, when I pre-ordered it, I had no idea that other people wouldn't have one because I got the email. And I was like, all right, yeah, cool. Let me put my deposit down. All right, awesome. And uh, I'm just assuming my friends did as well. And, you know, the next day happened and all of the news news articles were just like, oh, PlayStation 5 pre-orders sold out. What? I was like, what? Excuse me? Um, so I managed to secure one on launch day, which is great. Um, I love it. I've been playing it a lot. Uh, we're playing a lot of Warzone still. So, you know, there's still not that much new I've been doing with it. I've been playing Black Ops Cold War. I've been playing Spider-Man Miles Morales, but um, actually I purchased the Ultimate Edition, which comes with the PlayStation 4 game as well, so the original Spider-Man game. Oh, yeah. So I've been going back and finishing that, because if you recall in our last episode, I said that I never got to finish Spider-Man PS4. Which is insane so, to me, because I was yeah, obsessed yeah, with yeah. that game. I know. I know. I'm. Uh, Are I'm, you I'm, freaking I'm, out I'm, over I'm, Peter's new model? I honestly, I didn't notice it the first time. And then I saw the articles and I was like, I, I honestly, like, I, I don't care. <laughs> like, I just, I honestly, like he, he looks, uh, he looks and sounds like someone who would be named Peter Parker and has Spider-Man <laughs> abilities. Like that, like it, like that matters the most to me. I get, you know, how the original actor would be feeling for sure, but that's show business, right? I mean, it's not your IP. You got paid to, to appear in a, mm. in, in a game. So I'm sorry. It's but um, it's just it, funny. Like I can't think of another situation in the history of like any form of media where it's been like, oh, it's the same game. We're not changing anything except how one person looks. And like you could argue, yeah, they're trying to make him look more like Tom Holland, but they're not making him look like Tom Holland. So it just makes you wonder like why. But at the same time, I guess it doesn't really matter, right? <laughs> Apparently, it has something to do with the PlayStation 5's capabilities. I'm not sure. I, I, I'd need to educate myself on that. But yeah, I don't know. It is a strange thing. I guess it's kind of like being recast in a movie. But if that movie were coming out later by like a year, it'd and be it's like the same if the same movie. movie came out, but they just reshot the scenes of one act. Oh, basically, what happened yeah. to James? Uh, what was it James Spader? No, James, no, so Kevin Spacey, sorry. 
What was that movie oh, where right, they right. reshot all Kevin Spacey's scenes? Yeah, all the money in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's basically that, but in video game form. Yeah, I think I think that, I think that's it. You nailed it. Except I don't think the original actor got accused of what Kevin Spacey <laughs> was accused of. So, yeah, that's a little different. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll- the uh, the the pl- the, the PlayStation Five has been great, man. Um, honestly, I for me, it's the load times. Like, you know, there are no load times. Mm-hmm. I remember Spider-Man, the original game, had quite a few load times, you know, especially when you're fast traveling or, like, you know, booting up the game and things like that. And I was like, man, like, there are no more of those um, when you're loading and, you know, it's a slow motion kind of, like, yeah. Spidey still. There's none of that. There's no, no tips at the bottom of the screen. It's just, boom, you've started the game, you're in. Here you go. And it's just like, holy yeah. shit, man. Like, for, for a game to get rid of load screens altogether is a big thing for me. Um, so I am curious to see what else the PlayStation Five is able to do in the future. I've, it's been great. Can I, it, can I it, ask? Honestly, I, I oh, can I ask? Yeah, go. You said you're playing Call of Duty and some like older games as well. Do the does the hmm. control have haptic feedback for older games, or is it just the newer ones like the PS Five? So, so for Spider Man Remastered, yes, because they remastered it specifically for the PlayStation. Um, so the DualSense is able to take into account the haptic feedback. Um, so because I've got the new Call of Duty, so the Cold the Cold War, and I've got Warzone, which is the last generation's one, part of Modern Warfare, it's really easy to tell the differences. So the old games do not have, do not take advantage of the um, haptic feedback because I guess the developers haven't had the chance to optimize them or whatever. Um, but Black Ops Cold War absolutely does. And it is no, um, I guess it's no secret well, I mean, like they they out they came out and said in their advertising, the dual sense will make your like each gun feel different in your hands, and that is not an exaggeration because every time you pull the trigger, the amount of resistance in the trigger there's like a, kind of like a motorized spring in it, mm. and it's really really awesome to see how this technology it kind of has changed the vibrations in this controller because this controller. Is incredible. That was one of the things I hated about PlayStation always, and I loved about Xbox is the controller. Um, like the Xbox controller for me just blew PlayStations out of the water. But as soon as I opened this and put this in my hand and got that big bulky feel, I was like, "Yes, they've <laughs> finally fucking done it, man!" Like you know. Well, no controller for me will ever beat the GameCube, but I do love seeing. Um, I do love seeing advancements in controllers. It's usually sometimes the the biggest improvement with consoles, but it feels like the last few consoles, it has been stagnant as hell, like very few revisions. Uh, and then until we got the Switch, where the Switch introduce, introduced, I think they called it like 3D Rumble, which apparently is made by the same company that did the haptic feedback. And with the 3D Rumble, basically the idea was different, almost three vibrations or something. The idea was they could shift like the feeling of weight. So one of the tech demos was pouring a glass of water and adding extra ice cubes. And I saying you could feel the weight of that. That's and pretty seemed, cool. I love that. Yeah. And it seemed, but I, to be honest though, I haven't played a lot of Switch games that take good advantage of that. Like even Nintendo's ones, but it sounds like the haptic feedback is like the next logical step in that evolution where the resistance of triggers and stuff, like that's pretty big. Like that's the best thing about the Xbox controller, the springs and the triggers. I would say, yeah. and this sounds like it's just next level. I can't wait to try it. So the Xbox was, um, because I tried it with the Xbox when it originally came out, I definitely felt that that difference, right? Because especially when I was playing Forza and you kind of go over like gravel or leaves, you know, the triggers like vibrate and rumble. But this is, this, this is a whole different level, dude. Like this is, especially when you're swinging around the streets of New York City, when you, um, when, when you sling a web, and you're holding onto that web, it gets harder and harder to hold onto that web oh the higher God. you go. Wow. And it's it's really, really awesome. I mean, obviously you can turn all of this off in the settings and stuff like that, you know, in, if you if you get tired. Yeah. But I mean, I, I love it, man. Like, it's Have just you gotten subtle tired nuances. using the controller? No, 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 no. So I did, I, absolutely I did, not. I saw a comment from someone which I thought was interesting. They said, like, I th- I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. I probably got half the quote wrong, but it's something like, I said, like playing the PlayStation for an hour feels like you've been playing it for three hours. Not so much you're tired, but like just, and I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting, but I don't see how it would, it would take that much of a, of a physical toll over you. At- it's a bit of an exaggeration. Yeah. I think a lot of people, uh, people tend to get really like wrapped up in this kind of stuff, man. <laughs> and I'm just like, 
dude, I, I, I can play war like Friday nights are my war zone nights. Mm. <laughs> so I can, you know, and, 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 and cold war, but like, yeah, it, it, I don't think, I don't think it's that a big of a deal, but I mean, like, look, I really haven't been watching that many new things outside of the two movies that I'm going to be reviewing later. Um, I think I did make a promise on the last episode that I'd be reviewing Queen's Gambit. I am still uh, at the same exact spot that I was <laughs> in the last episode. I'm which hearing is a lot of hype. Two of the Queen's Gambit. I'm hearing a lot of hype. It's, it, I, I, yeah, I told you, man. It's it's fantastic. It is a it is a great show so far, um, and I really really do intend to finish it. It's just I just I have not had the opportunity because I've been playing with my new toy. But what what about you? What have you been watching? All right, I gotta say this. You went to uh, Made in the West, right? Mm. Oh, yeah, I saw a bunch of uh, Western Sydney short films. So shout out to Maine the West Film Festival. I'm their number one fan. I've been going every year for like about seven years now. Um, yeah, big sport of Western Sydney films. So shouts to all them. But the big thing I got to talk about, <clears throat> there's a show, a TV show that about 100 different people have said, Matt, you need to watch this. It's right up your alley. In fact, you're one of the people who told me this live in the air. Uh, you watched The Boys, finally. And yeah, yeah. Um, I am fucking furious at how much I like the show. I hate that everyone was right. <laughs> um, it, it, like, there's so many reasons for me. Matt, like, you, you, hold on, stop right there. Yeah. You love to be a contrarian. You love going against the grain. So when everyone tells you yeah. that this is going to be good, you love finding a way to not go with that po- opinion. I don't do it on and purpose, so but glad. you're right. You're right. Like, it's. it's I'm so glad it's that, like, the, that the boys won you over. I think it's like growing up with like listening to punk rock music, like don't conform or whatever. It's like in the back of a mind the still. System. Yeah. But like, oh, there's so much about the boys. It's like. <clears throat> Yeah, I feel like there's something about The Boys that makes me, like, it puts me off. First of all, The Boys is, like, the worst name for a TV show ever, I think. It's just a bad name. I don't like it. Uh, The team called The Seven, that's not much better either. But (coughs) I think also just, like, a lot of, like, the the stuff you hear about the show just sounds like it's really edgy for the sake of being edgy. And I think that also put me off a little bit. And also the fact that, like, these superheroes are clear stand-ins for the Justice League. But... I'm somehow okay with all of it because I just fucking love the show so much. I binged two seasons in about four days, which is kind of insane. I was so oh, fucking okay. addicted. Okay, so you've, you've finished. You finished all of it. Nice. I finished two seasons in less than a week. I was so okay. fucking addicted. I, I think the thing I like about it, besides like some of the social commentary, is that it really fills that hole left in my heart from Netflix Marvel shows. Like mm. and now, shows like Daredevil, for example, especially Daredevil. Um, would do like the street level stuff and it'd be kind of like, oh, what's it like living in a world where these other people have powers, but those characters don't like that level of like stakes is really, has always been really interesting to me. And the fact that it's also gritty and all that, it's, it's kind of like everything I liked about the tone of those Marvel Netflix shows is present here, but it's done better. Like it, the, the writing is better than most of those shows. I would say even some of the actors, uh, no, no hate to the ones I do like, but it, yeah, if you're a fan of the Marvel Netflix shows, I really recommend the boys. Cause it's very similar, like the, the grittiness of it too, but fuck dude, I Homeland is a cunt. That guy's a fucking yeah. douchebag. Can we just, just without, <laughs> without spoilers, without spoilers, talk to me about uh, Homelander. Cause I think Homelander is one of the most fantastic characters who graced the screen in a very long time. Like he is so ridiculously charming and interesting to watch because you just don't know what he's going to do next. Yeah. And like, I guess it's coming off like the whole political election where like you see one thing in the news and you hear other things online about all the candidates and stuff. And everyone's always trying to accuse the other one of being evil, but they act all nice on camera. That's really there. Like that. Everyone says that about every politician ever, but that's like a really front and center with Homeland the fact that he's always trying to present himself um, as like the world's savior and like the, the perfect ideal hero, but behind closed doors, he is the most evil son of a bitch ever. I'm surprised we haven't seen him kick a baby yet. Like his dude is a fucking evil. And then like, they keep taking it to like another level. Like at one point you find out like he, he like he raped someone. It's like, of course he did. Cause what else could he do? That's not fucking evil. Like he just, the, the scene with the plane is heavy. The it's burned into my mind. Oh my yeah. god! Like it, it's it's also like weirdly realistic. Like it makes you think about 
realism and and if you remind yourself about how these superheroes are stand-ins for like other aspects of life it's really accurate and scary it, the way they show how the media can be used to like spread lies and or, or, or do a spin on stuff and how pr kind of affects the world um i know these are some of the things around him but yeah i think also the uh, the concept of ego with homeland is really interesting and the weird like mother issues he seems to have like those scenes where he's like drinking the breast milk is i almost threw up man i thought it was gross i'm sorry if i offended anyone with that but oh i could not handle it and that relationship he had with that what <laughs> who, who are you gonna who are you gonna oh. offend lactating moms <laughs> <laughs> what, what i don't know i know some some weirdo with like a mom fetish i guess i don't know who he, he dresses up as an adult baby i don't know but fuck man like yeah, Homeland is crazy. I think even more so. I love um, Butcher. The I know he's yes. kind of like a bit uh, like Carl Urban. Yeah, he's got a bit of that Wolverine vibe to him, but he, he's he's also that like bad boy charmingness. I love um, fuck, what's his name? The main guy, uh, Huey. Huey, yeah, Huey's great. Um, I also love like like for example, like characters like Black Noir. You know nothing about him. Two seasons in. He's had like maybe 10 minutes screen time and I just, I want to know more. I, I did some reading and it seems to be like they're doing the complete opposite of what they did in the comics with him, uh, which is even more interesting because now I'm just like, I want to know more about this character and his world and fuck. It just, and just the idea that there are like so many superheroes out there, but like a lot of them aren't known because like of the way things are, it just makes you wonder who could be next, what could be happening now. Um, I think season two is really interesting as well because Homelander was sort of having to compete with the idea of him not being the best when, uh, what's the name? The, the Nazi bitch started getting, Stormfront. Stormfront. That's right. Stormfront was getting more like prominent. And then like they had the whole other stuff that went on with them. Yeah, man. It's a, it's a really good show. The writing. I love all the characters. I like how each character sort of represents like, a pathway of like the problems of fame. Like a train has had this really interesting journey. He's such an, he's such a fucking dick, but his storyline has been really interesting. And even um the deep, like I just keep thinking like, what are they going to do with this character next? Like season three, I have no idea where they're going to take the deep. Um, and even uh, Maeve, like Maeve just keeps like, it's interesting how those characters, they're not like the main story like story and like they just sort of see how like their lives play out, how they intertwine into the main story as well. But yeah, I think the thing I like most about the show is just these characters who have no powers and how they have to go up against like the impossible. Like that is just so such an adrenaline rush. It's so exciting to me. I'm to- I, I, from my understanding, that's not what it's like in the comics. Apparently they take, that um V nine or whatever it's called, and they get powers or some shit. Dude, I hope they don't I do love that. that in the you show. don't remember. You don't remember anything about it. Like, oh, um, it was like a week ago. I watched. I watched like a yeah, hundred yeah. episodes a week ago. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah no, nah, yeah. What was it called? It's a Voltage Nine, the Von Nine, whatever the drug's called. Um, yeah, I, forgot. I, forgot I hope they never. Actually. I hope they never get powers. Those characters because. I love it whenever like Homelander comes and they've got to like fucking hide. Yeah, I mean everyone shit. everyone loves a everyone loves an underdog story. I mean that one, that's what makes it interesting. I mean yeah. the whole I mean if you were to give me a one line kind of like sentence for this show to get me in is that you know how I mean what what ha- what would happen if Superman were evil and he were controlled by an evil corporation? Like I mean that to me is just like okay, I really really dig that. It's it's like and that's if, enough to get me in. If the if a PR firm got uh, like took like sort of controlled the kid from Br- uh Brightburn, <laughs> right? And went from there because it, it does feel scary at times. It's like fuck, what are they gonna do now? It's horrifying. Yeah, it's a great yeah, it's show. Horrifying. I can't wait for season three. It could not come soon enough. Yep, and it, look, it's been green lit. I mean, it was announced on Seth Rogen's uh Instagram, I think, uh, because it's him and his writing partner Evan Goldberg who created the show. When I found that out, Eric- my brain exploded. Yeah. By the way, holy shit. I think you, I think, I think you found that out on the podcast. <laughs> I think I told you that on the podcast. But um, along with the showrunner Eric Kripke, who very briefly, in a, I guess, a little bit of a segue to a talking point that is not really on the agenda, but we don't really need to talk about this for too long. It just really occurred to me. 
Eric Kripke also created Supernatural, which just celebrated oh, yeah. its series finale after 15 seasons, which is astounding to me. I mean, this is a show um, that I was there for the pilot the night it aired. Like, Same. I remember... I remember the night I watched it with my brother 15 years ago. Uh, I was in seventh, eighth grade, rather, and that premiere happened. And it, it was, you know, the, the like Dean comes to find Sam and, you know, the mother on the ceiling. And they're after that woman in white who's, like, taking guys off the side of the road and because they're unfaithful. And, man, that just started this whole love for me. Like, mm. you know, I fell in love with that show hard because of that premiere. Wait, and, um, did you did you sure watch I'd... all the way through all fifteen seasons? So, uh, so I, I watched. So I I watched it live seasons one, two, three, and four. Collected them on DVD and everything. I still have them. Um, and I used to introduce people to the show as well. I remember selecting the specific episodes, the mythology episodes, to actually show them the through line of the story, like not the <coughs> monster of the week ones, like kind of yeah. like the. This is the story in this episode. <laughs> and I remember I remember specifically off by heart kind of like remembering which episodes those were. And it was crazy. Like I used to wow. introduce this to everyone. Um, so I got up to, I think, season four or five, and then I kind of dropped off because at that age, once I started introducing the, the heaven and hell shit, of, was it that? Heaven and hell. Heaven and hell, most most specifically the, 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 the angels and, yeah. you know, the, the Cain and Abel. I dropped uh, off then look, too. Yeah. yeah I think but it's season in five. hindsight, in hindsight, it, it, like if I was watching that as an adult, that probably wouldn't, you know, make like, oh, that's not the reason that I would drop it because it makes hundred percent sense that there are angels because there's, there's demons in the show. There is a hell. <laughs> yeah. So there would be a heaven, right? Like it makes a hundred percent sense that it's biblical. So, um, yeah, man, like it, it, it's just really kind of like, it's kind of insane to see a show that you very specifically remember loving and you were there for the premiere finish. And, you know, from the reactions on Twitter that I happened to see, um, you know, it was kind of like mixed. It was, it ended on a bit of a mixed sort of note, mm. um, which is a bit, which is a bit sad, but I mean, look, you know, it is what it is. People are going to love and hate season, season series finales. Uh, apparently the latest seasons of Supernatural were really, really good. Mm. And I think, you know, that in itself is a testament to the show. Like for a show to have 15 seasons and to still be good seasons towards the end of the show is top notch. So I, I kind of want to just raise that just while we're talking about Eric Kripke a little bit. No, yeah. Like I think that is interesting to bring up. Like I think the th I would have trouble getting to that show now just because I watched a lot of CW shows when they started bringing out the superhero ones, like the flash and arrow. I got really into them and I was watching like four of those shows a week, maybe five, whatever. And at this point, like all those shows, are the fucking same to me, but the, it should be noted. Supernatural paved the way for shows like that. We probably wouldn't right, have those shows. Right. If it wasn't for shows like supernatural. Well, my brother just recently, I mean, cause it was on stand for so long oh. and he tried to, he tried, dude, he really tried to pick it back up. But because each season is like twenty three episodes, you're just not so used much. to that. Fuck. That you're just not used to that model anymore. And you know, it's so it's very clear that a lot of episodes these days are filler episodes because you just have to fill out that order. You know, that's a really good point. I feel like the show with like twenty three episode seasons is dying, and probably for a good reason. Like, unless it's like like a typical sitcom comedy, like I don't see drama shows doing well in that format. Like I think Breaking Bad had one or two seasons like that maybe, but they weren't even like the good seasons, I would say. Like cause I think season two was like what? 20 episodes, was it? No, no, it was probably 14. Breaking Bad? No, yeah, they were all. So the first season was um, seven episodes, yeah, which it, that was you can short. go and listen to on Bad Crystal. And then the second season and onwards, besides season five, was 13 episodes. Oh, 13. So okay, yeah. Two, okay, sorry, my bad. Two, two, three, and four were 13 episodes. And I think from memory, season five was 16 episodes. Yeah. Season five is weird because it's split in half. And I think, I could be wrong, but I think season one, did it end early because of the writer's strike or it was only picked up for six originally? It was originally picked up for six originally. Um, and there was a writer's strike. So, oh, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they didn't know if they'd get renewed or not. The, that writer's strike, man, the way it affected shows was so interesting. Uh, my favorite one's Scrubs because they were on their last season on NBC. Oh, no. Sorry. Yeah. NBC. 
It was season seven. It was a terrible season, by the way. Fucking one of the worst seasons of Scrubs, I would say. I would say it's worse than season nine, the one that everyone hates. But anyways, the writer strike comes, and then at NBC were like, "Hey, your contract's up. You're done." And they're like, "But we haven't finished our final season." But then ABC picked them up, and so they did a new season to close it off, season eight. And I would say season eight is one of the best seasons. Um, some of my favorite moments of that show are from that season. And like weirdly, that writer's strike ruined the show and then saved the show, but then kind of ruined it again because then ABC was like, well, we don't just, you were very successful. We don't want you for just one season. It sort of forced them to do another shitty one. Uh, sorry, that's a bit of a tangent, but I love Scrubs and I'll talk about it any moment I can. Uh, Hold on, I'm just uh, texting you the gif from Star Wars saying stay on target. Hold on, it should be coming through right now. Uh, should be coming through right now. <laughs> speaking of Star Wars, that's a great uh, segue if you want to get into that. Well, yeah, I thought about that segue, but I was like, I think we should get to the other piece of news first before we get to Star Wars because, you know, this piece of news is a little, is a little bit of a it's a little bit of a downer, a little bit more serious. Taking the world um, by storm too. Yeah, taking the world by storm. Uh, so, look, this is... This is not something that we generally talk about in upcoming attractions, but I think, you know, it, it is definitely uh, conversation worthy and it, it's going to be interesting to see what each party does, you know, in the future. But just recently, Johnny Depp left the Fantastic Beasts franchise um, in in light of the, the libel case that he was uh, that that the, that the court in England kind of went uh, went against him for. So Johnny Depp posted on the 6th of November on his Instagram, and I'm just going to read this short statement from him. In light of recent events, I would like to make the following short statement. Firstly, I'd like to thank everybody who has gifted me with their support and loyalty. I have been humbled and moved by your messages of love and concern, particularly over the last few days. Secondly, I wish to let you know that I've been asked to resign by Warner Brothers from my role as Grindelwald in Fantastic Beasts, and I have respected and re- agreed to that request. Finally, I wish to say this. The surreal judgment of the court in the UK will not change my fight to tell the truth, and I confirm that I plan to appeal. My resolve remains strong, and I intend to prove that the allegations against me are false. My life and career will not be defined by this moment in time. Thank you for reading. Sincerely, Johnny Depp. What do you make of this? Well, uh, I, have, I have a lot of thoughts, but I think the most interesting thing is... So, so a while ago, it went viral about his evidence of Amber. It's Amber Heard um, abusing. Amber Heard. Yeah, you're terrible um, with names. I'll give her whatever fucking name I want. Nah, uh, <laughs> nah yeah. So she that's was what abusing Johnny, that's him. That's what Johnny Depp said too. Yeah. Apparently, according to Amber Heard. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh damn. Uh, yeah, we but yeah, there was basically evidence of her abusing him, and it's pretty undeniable. And back then, people were campaigning that she should be fired from Aquaman 2. Nothing since then. Apparently, she will reprise or something will happen in Justice League. Uh, I think it just sounds like regardless of what happened, it was a very toxic relationship, possibly for the both of them. I don't think they brought out the best in each other. And, you know, it does seem like he is a bit of a victim. And in that case, it's really bizarre for Warner Brothers to uh, to sort of punish him for that, despite the fact that he has allegations against him as well. Uh, I do understand Warner Brothers being wanting to distance themselves from that, but it seems to be the public opinion seems to be on Johnny Depp's side rather than Amber's, which is really bizarre to me. Like, I'm not seeing a lot of people like getting mad at Johnny Depp. If anything, they're supportive towards him. So it, it's kind of bizarre because usually the reason a studio would drop someone would be because of public backlash. So I, unless there's like some facts in the case we don't know about or something else that's going on, I feel like we're missing a piece of the puzzle here. Like it seems bizarre. I, I, I could see a situation where there's this backlash and they bring him back maybe. I, I don't know. Uh, but it's a very bizarre scenario. What's your take on this, man? I, I definitely agree that it is a bizarre scenario, and I will concede to the fact that I don't know a lot of the facts of the case. I know that there was a lot of evidence that said that Amber Heard was kind of making this up, or you know, this a lot of it was fabricated, and that he was kind of like perceived to be as a bit of a victim. But here's the thing, right? So this case, this ruling by the court. Um, is public record, 
right? I mean, it is it, like this makes things official. This makes thing. This ruling is an actual thing in law. This is now, um, I guess, what they call precedent, which is when uh, previous like courts can can look back at previous cases and make decisions on current cases or future yeah. cases based on past cases. So. Um, I think what the studio is doing is kind of damage control. They're like, okay, look, this is now in the public eye. This is now official. This is now legitimate. Um, the court in this case has said, and I'll read you the judgment. I'll break it down in a sec. Um, has said that he is technically a wife beater. It is true. Hmm. So, and, and like, look, as much as I don't fully agree with that, mainly because I don't have the evidence in front of me, um, uh, you know, it is it is kind of what it is. And I don't think, um, I, I'm going to say this right now, I don't think Amber Heard's going to be in Aquaman 2. Like, I'm just, yeah. I know she's on the call sheet currently. They haven't started shooting, but I don't think she ends up in the final cut. If she does, it'll be massively reduced. Yeah. I, I just don't see it happening. Well, I think that um, actually, that happened to TJ Miller for Deadpool 2. Uh, he had some right, allegations yeah. against him or something, and you could tell, like, because he was a main character in Deadpool one. He's he is in Deadpool two, but it's incredibly reduced. He's basically there for a glorified cameo. It's like one or two scenes, right. uh, and I could so, see that maybe happening to her. But I think also her character would be very easy to write out. Right, exactly. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, but let me let me just read this. So this is just a bit of a breakdown. So apparently Johnny Depp brought the libel action under Section One One of the Defamation Act 2013 um, against a publication of an article which the headline said, this is from the Sun newspaper, by the way, the headline said, quote, Gorn Potty, how can J.K. Rowling be genuinely happy casting wife beater Johnny Depp in the new Fantastic Beasts films? Now, before a publication runs a headline like that, they must consult their solicitors and legal team and probably the risk team because that is in, in, insanely incendiary, right? Yeah. I mean, that is that is huge. Um, but essentially, the decision in the case, um, Justice Nickel found that while the statement of, quote, wife beater would cause serious harm to Depp's reputation, a fact which was accepted by the Sun's legal team in closing submissions, it was also found on the balance of probabilities that such a statement was true. Of the 14 incidents of physical violence alleged against then-wife Amber Heard, mm. 12 of them had been provided to the civil standard, have been proved to the civil standard, Damn. which is balance of probabilities. So, you know, you kind of need to weigh up that um, it's it's not a criminal trial, right? Criminal trial, the standard is that you need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it did happen, whereas in a civil case, you need to prove that, uh, on the, like, you need to kind of balance it out, right? Mm. Is it more likely that he did it than he didn't, right? Um, so... For the two incidents which could not be proven, the judge noted that this was due to certain facts not being put to Depp during cross-examination. Further, the judge rejected Depp's case that this was all a hoax concocted by Heard, finding that she had not been physically violent towards Depp. So, I mean, look, there's 12. <laughs> I think, I, like, I'm again, I'm not saying that, yeah. you know, I, I don't have the evidence in front of me. I can't weigh the balance of probabilities myself, but... The fact that there's 12 and all of those 12 were found on the balance of probabilities to have been true. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, again, not taking a stance. This is not a, yeah. this is not a, you know, an actual opinion. I'm just saying that this is what was decided in the case. And look, courts aren't always right. That's why we have an appeals process. That's why Johnny Depp is going to appeal, right? I mean, that like, if he seriously believes that there was a miscarriage of justice in this case, which he does, then he's going to appeal this case. I feel like, you know, Occam's razor, you know, the 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 most uh most likely, I think, scenario is if we had to guess what happened behind closed doors, is that both parties probably fucked with each other. Like I refuse to believe that right. someone like Johnny Depp would have gotten beaten and maybe did not try to at least defend himself or do something in return, you know? I don't think he's he doesn't seem like the most you know, down to earth human being ever. Like he's he's a pretty bizarre. Well, he's guy, been rich as shit for like twenty five years. Exactly. Right? I mean, like and that'll people, do things to you. Yeah, people with that much money, they don't like think like you and me. You know. Um, right, exactly. So I could imagine. You know, maybe it cuts both ways. Who knows? What I will say is because it seems to be there is a lot of public support for him. Um, I don't think it's the last we've seen of Johnny Depp. 
Um, you, no, I, I, I think not. of I think of cases like Aziz Ansari, where you know he had people for and against him, and he's still able to. He had to take some time off, but he came back and he's doing decently well now. I would say. Uh, and then, uh, and you, then again, you look at people like we're going to talk about him later, Mel Gibson, who there is evidence of him being anti-Semitic and violent towards his wife. And you know, he's got a career now. He's got Fat Man out. He was in Daddy's Home too. And you know, I think he was nominated for an Oscar for fucking um, Hacksaw Ridge. So uh, I'm not saying that's good, but I'm just saying that like if you are famous and rich enough. You can your career can bounce back. Uh, so Johnny Depp fans, maybe you won't see him in Fantastic Beasts, but you know, you'll you'll probably see him in fucking I don't know parts of the Caribbean Twelve or some shit. T- tell you what though, uh, apparently the the actor that is in talks to replace him as Grindelwald might actually be a better fit. Uh, it's Mads Mikkelsen from Doctor Strange, Casino Royale. Um, and, love and me he some is, Mads. He is an Mikkelsen. incredible actor. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, gotta absolutely. love, gotta love. The OG Hannibal. He's not right. OG, but still. Abs- absolutely. Speaking of Mads Mikkelsen, who was in a Star Wars film, let's segue over to another Star Wars What a fucking reach. Holy oh, shit. Dude. Reach I, of the century. I, Are you Mr. Fantastic had, from the Fantastic Four? Dude, that is a reach. I had, I had a few to choose from, right? So I had <laughs> initially, uh, we were talking about, what was, the, what was your one that you made? What was your segue that you made? I can't uh, remember. You, we said something about Star Wars. I can't remember. Yeah, Rewind so the episode, that, tell us. There was that, but there was something else more blatant because you were talking about the boys and one of the villains in the boys is Giancarlo Esposito, who is the villain in Mandalorian. Oh, so I was trying to make that connection, dude. but I couldn't because I wanted to- Oh, I you reminded get, um, me. Thing in there. When you told me on air that he was in the show, I was like, oh my God, it's amazing. But the whole time I was thinking like, can I imagine him in a cape being a superhero? And it's like, well, I guess he's in Mandalorian. And then I saw him like, he's like a PR guy. I'm like, oh, okay. This is, this sort of makes, or he's CEO. I'm like, okay, I get this. But the fact that he could still be his badass self and like scare a fucking superhero, it's like- I fucking love this man. This this guy's attached yeah, to the awesome. best fucking projects. I swear to God. He's awesome. He's awesome. Anyway, I've been trying to make this segue, but I, I'm just not even going to try to. <laughs> uh, like, all right, well, let's talk about Mandalorian chapters 11 and 12. Chapter 11 first. Let's talk about The Heiress, directed by Bryce Dallas Howard. Talk to me. Uh, it was really good. I thought she did a really good job. I saw a lot of people actually praise uh, her work. Um, I'm just pulling it up to remind myself what happened in this episode. Because it feels yeah, like it's so a decade ago. This was the one where... Where they have to bring down the ship or, or hijack the ship, essentially. What are your thoughts on this episode? <laughs> well, you are, I'm you pulling are terrible. It up. I'm pulling it up. <laughs> you are terrible. I'm struggling. Yeah, so this this episode was great. Um, and look, I am kind of... By, by episode three, I was feeling the... the, the um, Man, like the whole mission of the week shit is kind of getting to me a little bit. Um, but I do like the connections to the overall overarching story. We meet Bo-Katan, um, who is a character from apparently Rebels or Clone Wars. One uh, of them, yes, I don't know. Yes. Cre- created by D- Dave Filoni. Um, and, 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 you know, we did get a reference to Ahsoka Tano, who we know is played by Rosaria Dawson, who is the Jedi that the Mandalorian is looking for. So that's really cool. That's really awesome. This is the, the episode sequence- with the, this is the episode with the um, man- other Mandalorians that come back. Yes. Mm, yes. Wow. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, well, welcome to uh, Planet Earth. Apparently, uh, did you hear George Lucas was on set and like named one of them? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. He apparently he was on set one day um, and he's like, they're like, oh, this guy doesn't have a name. And he's like, here's a name. And I don't know. I think that's cool that George Lucas is still. Oh, yes. It was, it was exactly <laughs> as I intended when I made it in 1977. <laughs> that was the name I intended. Yeah. That was the name I intended for that bunny, bunny hunter that I knew would pop up in a show in 2020. That's exactly what it was. Um, right but, on. I mean, That's oh, exactly what sorry. happened. Um, look, George, get out of my room, please. God damn it. He, he likes to, he's, he's blown through his $4 billion of Disney dollars. Uh, George, George, and come back just- in here, George. George, come back in here. We've got, we got so many questions. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a new interview here at Midnight Double Feature uh, with George Lucas, the man himself. So, so George, please tell us, back in 1977, <laughs> When you knew that in 2020 that we were going to do a a show about a bounty hunter, like, what was your vision? Like, did you know it'd be exactly how it is now? Well, look, really, it was exactly as I intended. Uh, 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 You know, it's basically what what Disney have been doing is they've been ripping me off. And um, 
the the four the four billion dollars that they have paid me, uh, I'm not I'm not really, you know, I, I, I've I've spent it already. I, I you know, <laughs> uh, uh, George, George, uh, are you okay? It sounds like you're struggling there. I, uh, I'm a bit nervous because you know I'm I'm kind of in um I'm I'm kind of starting a lawsuit um because you know. Well, I mean, this is all as exactly as I intended. You should see my papers. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of I kept it locked away in a, in a drawer at uh, Lucas Ranch at uh, Skywalker Ranch, sorry. And uh, you know, somehow they broke into my office and and, and stole Disney stole into my uh, broke into my office. So, so George, you're saying that everything about Star Wars has come out exactly as you intended. This, this is this has been your vision from the start. Well, look, my my vision from the start was was episodes four, five, and six. And look, I. I Knew the entire time that Luke and Leia were brother and sister. The, the kiss in Empire Strikes Back was just, just you know, just foreplay, right? I mean, that's that's fine. It's it's fine. Uh, but then George, I made one, George, two, and three. But, I'm sorry, yes. but like just to clear things up, what is your stance on incest? Um, you know, hold on, my my, my, my lawyers are telling me not to answer that one. <laughs> oh fuck, George, get the fuck out of here, man. Get the fuck. Out okay, of here. okay. Uh, I'll see you guys later, but uh, enjoy talking about the Mandalorian, and uh, don't forget that that came from my mind. All right, see you later. <laughs> so, have you missed and, it? Uh, George Lucas was here. Man, uh, look, I went downstairs to grab a cup of coffee, and in the hallway, I passed George Lucas, and he is not looking good. Um, he says he says that he is currently living on credit from Disney. Um, I, I don't know what he did with the with the money that. That they gave him to buy the property, but man, like he is just not looking good these days. I don't know what he's. It's what crazy. He's thinking, but anyway, like the other day, actually, I was I was I was driving down the street and I actually saw him. He 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 was in a car crash. He actually like. Fuck you! Fuck you! Don't talk George, about me. George, George, I'm telling fuck the you. story. Yeah, he actually crashed into someone, and the whole time he just kept saying, "It's how he intended. He had planned this out several years ago." And they're like, "George, you clearly didn't mean to run over three." three children and he was like no it's part of his original vision and like I, I don't think he's right man i don't think Look, he's right um, i just i just received an email um he said that midnight Dollar feature was an intellectual property that he created back in 1981 <laughs> so you know i don't know what's going on here uh, right, this let's is get incredible. back to this let's yeah. get back to this uh, the mandalorian <laughs> uh this this was an this was a fantastic episode and the show continues to show you just how much money was thrown into this production Holy man. like shit. this is yeah. this is such a beautiful looking tv show and this episode really really highlights that um it's really awesome to see the og uh stormtroopers again the you know it, it's really fantastic um titus welliver is the guy who plays the imperial captain he's kind of like the pilot there in the in the ship he's great um not the pilot but yeah he's awesome man like he pops up in heaps of shit um, and, you know, I like that we kind of like get our first glimpse at Moff Gideon, you know, Giancarlo Esposito's character in this episode via hologram. He's 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 fucking awesome, dude. Uh, but I also like that we get a little bit of Mandalorian mythology, you know, like Bo-Katan and the other two Mandalorians, they take off their helmets. Right. And much to Mandalorian's surprise, it's like, whoa, dude, what the fuck are you doing? And Bo Katan goes ahead and tells you, "Hey, man, like this is like you—you you are part of the sect that broke off from the Mandalores, and that that sect continues to keep their helmets on. Like we yeah. do different shit. It's like, and it's just like, man, that's awesome. It's great world building. Yeah, it's like this is the way, but your way is different to our way because the what everything we've been told is wrong. Like it's crazy that everything we've sort of known from season one and other stuff, the way that it's sort of." able to sort of weirdly retcon it, but in an interesting way in, in the space of like what, two sentences, it was pretty insane. Like that was a really interesting moment. And I wonder how it's going to play out in the future. It also yeah, explains, absolutely. like I always thought it was weird. Like what these guys are supposed to wear the helmet 24 seven. That's a little weird. Like I, I know it's star Wars, but even my star Wars dance, star Wars, it dude, seems I a bit never, never double top thought that like it was cool with, um, I'm not sure it was that episode or episode or then one after it, but you get to see him drink and he had to like sort of lift it up for like a brief second. And it's like that his life must not be convenient. And now it all makes sense to me. Cause yeah, he's a part of a cult. It's meant to be fucking weird. Right, and that whole element is pretty cool. But like when Bo-Katan takes her helmet off, and it's Katie Sackoff, who is kind of like a a legend in science fiction TV. 
Um, she played one of the leads in Battle Battlestar Galactica, and she is just. You know, she played Starbuck, and I've been watching Battlestar Galactica. She is awesome, dude. Her act, like, that actress is just incredible. That show is incredible. Um, but it, she also played Bo-Katan in the original, like, the first time you see her, like, I think in Clone Wars or Rebels. But she is, like, Bo-Katan has always been played by Katie Sackhoff, and it's kind of cool that the actress who played her originally in the cartoon, like, actually had the opportunity to play her in the live action, a live action show. Which is fantastic. Yeah, the what something the Mandalorian's getting really good at is fan service to the hardcore fans. Like while the while the new movies and stuff, their fan service is like, hey, here's R two D two for the ten millionth time. Remember him and the theme song. Like this, they it feels like a show meant for like the hardcore OG Star Wars fans because the little Easter eggs you get are like the ones you would not see coming especially if you're not deep into the lore. Like, I find that really cool about the show. And the way it's not no, totally exactly. in your face. Like, we still haven't seen a, a proper lightsaber yet. That's amazing. I love that. And there was a dark saber right, exactly. for, like, one shot, I think it was. But, yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, I'm loving... Uh, uh, yeah, I think the action scenes were really good in this as well. I think um, I, I think that about both these episodes, The I feel like it's only getting better. This season, the, action, the directing of the action scenes is is even better than last season. Um, this is a good episode. I think I like the next one even more, though. Yeah, we can talk about the next one. So the next episode was The Siege, and really awesomely, it was directed by Carl Weathers, yeah. who plays Grave Carga, which is which is really cool to see, man. Apollo Creed directing episodes. Man, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm all in for that, man. That's yeah. awesome. Apparently, he um, went to John Favreau on his hands and knees and begged him yeah. to direct an episode, and you can yeah. tell that, man. I really like how... There's a lot of like chase scenes in this with the like the the speeders and stuff like that. I thought that was really cool. I really enjoyed those scenes. This I- felt really episode four to me. I don't know why. I think it's the, I think it's the base, like the like the visual style of the base. I, I don't know why this felt very episode four. Maybe we're in the when they're in the in the cavern in the valley and it felt like the trench run somehow. Mm. I don't know. I got that like vibe it, too. Yeah. Yeah. And when when you see the Tie Fighters take off, I'm just like, oh shit, here we go. This is gonna be this is gonna be awesome. But yeah, man, it was it was a like that action sequence might be one of my favorites in the entire series. Like it, it continues to to top itself. Yeah, like the great thing about this show, like the stuff that's accomplishing that the Disney films could not do, it kind of blows my mind. Like, I admittedly, okay, some of them did like some new interesting things, but we're getting this every episode consistently. Like we're getting. I don't know if we ever saw a chase like that in any Star Wars medium. Uh, I'm sure there's been something, but that's interesting. Even just to go back to the last episode, there was a shot that just really, I found really interesting. It was kind of like a ATST with the legs, but it was like a crane used like fishing stuff out mm. of the water. And like, of course that exists in that world. That That's, that's great world building. I love seeing that stuff. Uh, but yeah, going back to this episode, uh, Dude, I don't know what else to say other than like these visual effects are insane. The stuff they're doing with that and, and the way they're setting up with the whole Darksaber thing, um, where they're going with that. I think I think I'm blurring episodes together now. But Yeah, you are. But Carl Weathers. I, I, didn't, I, did, did I don't think you I don't think you you remember anything. <laughs> I watched them back no, to back. Actually, I, I actually watched yeah. the, the the first one a bit later, and I watched them so the same day. This episode ended with Moff Gideon in the Flash, kind of examining these what they're called. I, I did a little bit of research. They're called Dark Troopers, so um, th- a little bit different to the Death Troopers uh, in Rogue One. In that the Dark Troopers, apparently in canon, have Jedi capabilities. They actually have Force cap- capabilities, what which is fuck? really going to be interesting. Uh, yeah. So that's how the child is going to factor in, probably because they. Yes, yeah. and and my question is, what was in that goddamn tube? Because <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know if that's what the if that was like a failed experiment for the dark trooper or something, but that was that was really intriguing. I like that we kind of I... get a bit more mythology each time, you know. Yeah. Like, like it, the start of this episode really pissed me off. I'm not going to lie. Why? Because it's like. Because it's dude it, for the for the fourth time, fifth time. What episode is this? Five. We've landed in a location. You know, Mando wants to do something. Oh, but first, help me do this. And then 
it, it felt so by the numbers, man. And I was like, fuck, are we going to do this again? Yeah, God, I feel we're gonna like. Go, we're going to go, we're going to go assault a different location. And, you know, but I, I like the connectivity that we eventually end up with at that location. You know, if it wasn't for that last kind of like 20, 15 minutes, maybe, then this episode would have sucked ass. Because honestly, I that turned me off so quick. I'm really, <laughs> really getting over that whole landing in a location because we need to out of necessity, but being strong armed into helping people. Oh, like yeah. I get it. That's a Western trope. And this is a show with Western bones. But man, eventually it just starts to get really, really repetitive. Oh, no, like you, you, like the, the structure of these scripts is the most obvious here than it ever has been. And it, you're right. It's always land in a location because we need to get a MacGuffin, but you, but the person won't give you the MacGuffin unless you do the favor for them, which is help them kill somebody or get something or something that involves shooting someone in the face. And it, it the feels most- like just, just very briefly, it feels like, uh, you know, in a lot of open world games, you go, you go to an NPC, <laughs> they set you a mission task, you go collect that shit, you come back and you keep doing that. Yeah. And it's just, eventually you stop doing those missions. Yeah. And it's like, you, you, you can put up with it in a video game, but in a TV show where it's not interactive, it's, it's a bit frustrating. And it was, the, the, it was really bad in this because the way they worded it, it seemed like they knew like they were doing, it's almost like they were trying to wink at you. I don't think it was that intentional, but like he literally says, Something like, like it, he acts as if, uh, it, as if Amando already knows he has to do it. Cause he's like, oh, what's going to take some time? So yeah, we're going to do this. He's like, why would I do that? He's like, you're going to help me. You have got time to kill. So why not help us out? And it's like, what the fuck? Put some effort in this shit. Like, yeah, that was a bit frustrating. But like I said, I say this every week, I can put up with it because I'm loving these VFX. I'm loving this world building. I'm loving this shit. I, I'm 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 very easily able to forgive it, and these both episodes had some really interesting lore stuff in there. Uh, you mentioned the, the the failed experiment, the clone thing. I thought, and I'm probably very wrong on this. I thought it was either to do with like an experimental clone of Darth Sidious or Snoke trying to tie into like the Disney films, because I I don't think that is what it was, but I I do wonder when they will start showing the transition between the original trilogy to the sequel trilogy. Cause I imagine at some point they're going to have to start doing breadcrumbs for that. I think, I think we're still a very long way away because the, in this, the empire has just fallen, mm. right? So the empire has just fallen. Luke and Leia and Han is still very young, right? I mean, like, I feel like the, like by the time we catch up with them in episode seven, they're super old. Kylo Ren is a man. Like, you know, he's born, right? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know, I, but I imagine the First Order, like, I don't know, how long were they around before those movies? We don't know. Right. But I imagine- yeah, we might we might say the birth of the First Order, absolutely. Yeah, like, I feel like that's going to happen in the show at some point. Unless the, the behind the scenes, they actively try to avoid the Disney but shows also, to keep it nostalgic. I don't want to see it. <laughs> yeah, you know? like I get I that, like because I think the appeal of the show is how much it reminds you a little bit of the original trilogy, right? And the Disney, for some people, it sort of poisons the franchise. Some people don't like that. So while I well, think it would make sense to start tying into that, I can see why they wouldn't want to as well. Yeah, it, it, it reminds me of the, of the original trilogy, but it also feels very fresh at the same time. You know, like it's its own thing. Like it's introducing new ideas, new concepts to you. So once you start venturing anywhere near the Skywalker trilogy or the Skywalker saga, it starts to feel really, really, you know, it'd been there, done that. Yeah. Like they could, the this, this series finale could be the Battle of Jakku, the one we never see. Who knows? But I doubt they'll go that far. I, I, I imagine they're going to try and stick as close to Jedi, Return of the Jedi as possible. Either way, I love this show. It's so great. It's just a roller coaster of a TV show, and I can't believe we have it. It's it's we're very lucky to. Oh, have absolutely! It. I'm thankful as shit. Um, I, right, I also man. read something today, real quick, about um, apparently the Mandalorian has five times as many viewers and watches than anything else in Disney Plus. I read that headline. I'm like, of course, it's the only decent show that's exclusive to the platform right now. Uh, and, and yeah, right. Exactly. It's keeping Disney plus alive basically, uh, for now until we get uh wonder virgin in January. So mm-hmm. that'll be really interesting. 
But um, anyway, let's move on to our trailers. We know that this episode is going long, but fuck it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's get to let's go to the trailer for a movie called Pieces of a Woman. Now, this trailer really stuck out to me. It, it is definitely an Oscar movie. Um, but I again have done a one eighty on Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think Vanessa Kirby is an incredible actress. You know, she deserves a lot better than Hobbs and Shaw, but. You know, she was she popped up in Mission Impossible Six or yeah six. Um, fuck, I lost count there for a sec. It's Mission <laughs> Impossible Fallout that she was in, but yeah, she's awesome, dude. She looks this this movie looks absolutely awesome. Like I thought this trailer was really great. I you know it is a it is dealing with something that a lot of people do deal with, and it hasn't really doesn't really get covered in a lot of movies. And that's you know when you lose a child, like how do you move forward? You know how do you move forward? And how do you rebuild yourself? You know, like how do you like you are shattered, your family shattered. Mm. You know, you've bought all of these things for your child that is about to be born. And how do you get rid of those things? Like, you know, how do you start erasing and moving on? And it's really interesting to me to see a character like Vanessa Kirby's character, who is a mother who is attached to their child that they've been growing in their stomach for so long. While, you know, you've got Shia LaBeouf's character, who is presumably the lover or the husband. I don't know who is begging her to move on. And I think this really speaks to the difference between a mother and a father. Um, and I guess the connectivity yeah. of the connectivity to the child, you know, um, and it's going to be really, really interesting. And I really am excited for this movie. The early reviews for this have been glowing as well. So what do you think about this? What do you think about this, uh, this trailer? Yeah, man. Um, looks like an actor's showcase. It, uh, it, I'm definitely, I feel like it, it's in that um, same wheelhouse as a film like, um, what was it called? Marriage Story. Like obviously very different sort of topic, but the same sort of like ballpark of a film. Uh, yeah. Actor, uh, actor showcase. Vanessa Kirby looks amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm weirdly excited to see Shia LaBeouf in this. Like I, I feel like he's going to be all, I feel like he's going to get like a really good scene at some point. Like, well, I think she will get the, the the big part of the meat to chew on. I haven't seen seen him in something I've liked in a while, and I feel like this could be his opportunity to like really wow me. Uh, and and yeah, another big get for Netflix. Good on Netflix for for, for getting this one. Uh, I don't. Interestingly, know if- Benny Safty is in this. Uh, Benny Safty is one of the two brothers that directed Good Time and Uncut Gems. Oh, uh, that's pretty okay. Cool. Uh, the only other yeah. thing I can think of is. Yeah, no, yeah, it just looks like a great, great Oscar-y type film. Keen to see it. It looks great. I, yeah. It looks great. I, I'm, I'm really excited for that. Let's get to something that I am, I, I personally am less interested in, but you want to talk about Tom and Jerry, the movie. <laughs> um, okay, look, this is, I, I'm not sledging Tom and Jerry, the movie uh, at all. I think it looks fine. The trailer didn't do too much for me. I, I like, I, you know, I think if I was a bit younger, um, I might be into it. I, I, I again, I'm not the target audience. But then again, I'm not the target audience for a Pixar movie either. You know, like mm. I'm not like you know Pixar do things in their films that blow me away. Nothing in this trailer really blew me away other than Tom and Jerry. And Tom and Jerry's not really a cartoon that I watch. You know, very religiously as a child or anything like that. I was familiar with it. Familiar with the hijinks. Um, I, I, I've always loved the idea of you know. The, the whole Roger Rabbit concept of bringing cartoons and animation into the real world. I really, really dig that. Um, and I know it's a terrible movie, but Looney Tunes back in action was a, you know, <laughs> a, uh, a favorite of mine growing up. I love um, how you skipped of- over the obvious Space Jam references yes, you could have yes, made. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, but uh, this didn't do too much for me. Um, you know, I, I, it's definitely not one that I'll be watching. Um, it, it reminded me a lot of Sonic. In a lot of ways, um, you know, like I watched the Sonic trailer, I finished it and I was like, oh, yeah, that, that looks cool. It's not for me and there's nothing in it that's really going to bring me to it. Whereas like I watched the Soul trailer and I was like, holy fucking shit. Soul <laughs> looks absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, but yeah, talk to me about your interest with John and Jer- uh, John- Tom and Jerry, the yeah. movie, not John and Jerry. Like, Jesus Christ. I was a bit of a fan of Tom, of the old school classic Tom and Jerry's growing up, but what gets me excited is the animation of this. It is insane. I think the animation, the 2D animation quality here is blowing me away. And the way they interact with the physical environment is like, I think kind of 
revolutionary. Like I, I've, I can't remember the last time I've seen 2D animation interact with real life people this level. Like I, it's, it's like uh, we haven't had a film like this in a long, long time. Obviously, like you said, we're not the target audience. It's meant for like little children, but little children probably have no idea who the fuck Tom and Jerry are right now. So it is, it is uh, an interesting choice of doing that. Uh, I, I do question plot wise, like how they start off, like they've been enemies for years, but now they're friends and they put them in a scenario where they have to be enemies again. Um, it seems a bit odd to do that, but I imagine what they're trying to do is set up some sort of like emotional climax where they learn to get along or something like that. Um, I'm hoping my fingers are crossed. My fingers are crossed and maybe my expectations are higher than they should be for a show like this, but I want them to give me a Pixar moment at the end. I feel like they have the potential to do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm really hoping they have some sort of mature emotional climax in the end with these characters. I, it may be asking a lot from a franchise like this, but that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, but the other thing is to, yeah, I just really love the animation and I, I, do have a soft spot for that old school cartoon humor. I love seeing Looney Tunes done right. I uh, and I love I love seeing this. So I am surprised. I was very surprised to see this trailer. I had no idea it was going to come, but I I really I'm ki- very curious to see how it looks on the big screen. I I hate to do this to you, um, but I can just looking at the director. I can probably guarantee you that this is not going to be good. Um, <laughs> this is. Re- this is directed by Tim Story, who did Fantastic Four 05 and Fantastic Four Rise of Silver Surfer. He did Ride Along, Ride Along, Ride Along 2, Shaft. Uh, uh, I don't, uh, if you're hoping for a Pixar moment, I don't think it's going to yeah, be it. Yeah, probably. Sorry. Although I will say I watched for the first time the other day Ride Along 1, and I was mm-hmm. pleasantly surprised. Like I'm, I've said it before, I'm not a diehard Kevin Hart fan, but I, I had a good time with that movie. That, that movie was pretty fun. Just interestingly, just to very, very briefly tangent off that, I kind of have been become a, a bit of a diehard Kevin Hart fan. Like I read his book, um, he dropped his latest Netflix special, and it is awesome. Like I'm, he does it I'm in his basement. I'm halfway through it. I'm halfway through it. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was great, man. Like, did you get up to the greeting part? I love the greeting part. Greeting like part. when he's talking about the greetings and them in the Walmart. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm part. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, <laughs> I am all about that. I know he's um. <sighs> I don't know. His stand up has trouble getting me sometimes. He, he can he can make me laugh. I don't think he's bad. It's just I I'm always constantly surprised at how famous he is. I feel like there's just so many other funnier people out there, and I just never understood his appeal. Like I get on Instagram, he's inspirational, but like I don't think that's the reason he's famous. It's it's not it's not that he's the funniest person out there. I. Do. Hundred percent, do not think that. It's just I think he's worked hard to be where he wants to be. Like I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of just the stand up and the films, uh, like and other things that he's done as well. Um, I think he's uh, like I, I don't know. Maybe it's because I read the book. Yeah, um, you know, like a, I, I, I will say something I found really interesting about the stand up special. I think this might be the first stand up special released, um, or, or at least to a big scale during covid like the the entire audience are wearing masks sometimes they laughs even sound muffled because of the masks i felt it was they're, they're all socially distanced it is very interesting to see stand-up done in this context it it's still the same sort of vibe like they're able to capture the same sort of vibe of a stand-up show but just the way that they they've done all that and also we're getting covid jokes in a majorly released uh stamp special i think this might be the f- world first uh, seeing that, which like doesn't, you know, I just think that's interesting to point out. But yeah, let's move on. Yep. Uh, what's next on the to-do list? Absolutely. So we've got another trailer, a- another Oscar trailer. Let's talk about One Night in Miami. So this is a movie that's directed by Watchmen actress Regina King, and she's a she's an Oscar winning actress as well. She was in a bunch. She's been in a bunch of things. Um, but this movie looks awesome. This trailer I thought was really really fantastic. I think. I think it's coming to Amazon Prime. I might be wrong on that. Uh, I think you're right. I'm pretty sure it's for Prime Video. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the concept of this film is fictional but inspired by true events. And it's like, what if these four people who were famous around their time and sort of in the same sort of field, what if they met for one night? Is, is that is that the concept? Am I, am I 
right there? Yes, that's correct. So, um, yeah, basically you have Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, and Sam Cooke, who were all very revolutionary and very outspoken people in the kind of like fields. So Sam Cooke was a professional singer and Jim Brown was a football player. I don't want to, like, I mean, you know, I'm not going to explain Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali because it's pretty obvious who they were. <laughs> but, um, you know, like these these guys were kind of like really outspoken about black rights and civil rights and it's 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 really going to be interesting. I've heard this movie being described as somewhat of like a play, you know, like they, this is the most of the movie kind of like takes place after a Muhammad Ali fight. And I think I can't remember who it's like who he's who is fought. Like the fight itself was real, but I think the actual meeting of these four is not real. Yeah. Um. So it takes place in a kind of like a hotel room or a hotel, and they kind of go through their backstories and things like that. Um. I'm not really 100 percent sure, but I am excited just on that concept alone. Um. The uh. God damn it. What else? Oh. Um. The trailer actually kind of points out this whole um element of because it's not he's not muhammad ali yet he's cassius clay right he hasn't converted to islam yet and like the i think i think that is a big part of it because malcolm x kind of moves him in to islam and like he's really curious about how moving into it um Mm. or or rather rather the 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 brotherhood of islam so it's going to be really interesting from that perspective as well um you know early word is that this is a best picture contender Mm. and i i can see that from the trailer i think you know given the times that we live in given what's happened this year in terms of uh civil rights and the suppression of civil rights i think that this is a very important movie and i think that this is probably going to be a solid directorial debut from regina king i imagine you're probably right there i i I have trouble like forming a strong opinion on this which i don't think i say very often on this podcast just because I can see how the concept is there. And I, it's like, this. It'd be like, wouldn't it be interesting if these four people met? But I don't know what you do once that happens. Like, I, I have no idea what to predict. Like, I can see- That's the, a good thing. I can, yeah, like, and I don't have that very often. Like, I, I, I usually have my theories. I usually have ideas. But, like, I can see the opportunity for a powerful message or a powerful uh, tale. I have no idea what that is, though. Like, I- I can guess the ballpark, but like, I wouldn't know if you told me put these four characters in a script together, I wouldn't really know where to start, especially if you told me to start it off with a Muhammad Ali fight. Uh, maybe, maybe it requires a bit of um, his- historical knowledge, which I'm sure the film would educate me on, but yeah, but like, it's kind of cool to not have uh, many expectations or or estimates of where the plot will go so, so let me yeah. let me just let me just read this for you so this is the, the the plot kind of like summary on imdb and it looks it sounds really awesome um so it's set on the night of february 25th 1964 um by the way this is when martin luther king was really really active um he was assassinated in 1968 so this is right around this was happening um, one night in Miami follows a young, brash Cassius Clay as he em- emerges from the Miami Beach Convention Center, the new heavyweight boxing champion of the world. Against all odds, he defeated Sonny Liston and shocked the sports world. While crowds of people swarm Miami Beach to celebrate the match, Clay, unable to stay on the island because of Jim Crow-era segregation laws, spends the evening at the Hampton House Hotel in Miami's African-American Overtown neighborhood, Overtown neighborhood celebrating with three of his closest friends, Malcolm X, Sam Cooke, and Jim Brown. During this historic evening, these icons, who each were the very representation of the pre-Black Power movement and felt the social pressure of their crossover celebrity brought, uh, shared their thoughts with each other about their responsibilities as influencers, standing up, defending their rights, and moving the country forward to equality and, in, equality and empowerment for all black people. The next morning, the four men emerged, determined to, determined to define a new world for themselves and their community. Sounds pretty cool. Right, so it might like highlight some fictional scenarios that would inspire them to do le- their later great works or something. Right, kind of like, like, like a, a what fake, if. like a yeah, a fake origin story in, in a way. That I wouldn't say fake. I'd say fictional. Fictional. Okay, sorry. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, a lot of potential to go with that. Uh, I'm keen to see it. Yeah, sounds awesome, man. Let's move on to another one. Let's move on to probably the most blockbustery of the set of trailers that we're talking about today. 
Chaos Walking is a movie directed by Doug Lyman, who did, and I'm doing this all off memory, he did The Born Identity, he did The Edge of Tomorrow, he did Jumper from memory. Uh, but yeah, he's a solid director. Um, this is starring, uh, I was just about to say Ray, uh, Daisy Ridley <laughs> and Tom Holland. And uh, this has Mads been Mikkelsen's in- also in it, I'm pretty sure, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this has been in production for a very long time. This, okay, let me, so um, in October 2011, Lionsgate acquired the distribution rights to a film adaptation of Patrick Ness's Chaos Walking Trilogy, which is obviously the book. Um, this was shot in 2017, which oh, is wild. It's almost like a new mutant scenario, except they didn't announce everything too early. <laughs> well, it, it might be a new mutant scenario because apparently in April it screened um, and apparently it followed, like it had really poor test screenings. Oh um, fuck! Really? Yeah, yeah, dude. That's, and that's... you know, it's, it's apparently it's it's bounced through a bunch of directors. Uh, one of them being Fetty Alvarez, who did Don't Breathe and the Evil Dead Down the Wreck remake. But it eventually went to Doug Lyman, who is a pretty big director, to be honest. Damn, I'm really disappointed to say that because I love this trailer. Um, I like sci-fi with like a unique concept and the idea of everyone can see your thoughts. And and it seems like projections of your thoughts. I find that to be a really interesting concept. And the idea of Daisy Ridley character, it seems like she's the only female on the planet and she's the only one that people can't see her thoughts. That is interesting. And I also just love the idea of seeing Tom Holland share a scene with Daisy Ridley. Like that's, I don't know why that's exciting to me, but it is. Uh, and I love how Mads Mikkelsen looks in this with the longer hair. Uh, that's pretty badass. And yeah, everything about this trailer honestly looks fucking great to me. Uh, I, I, I only watched it before we started recording and I was just like, fuck, this looks really good. I will say though, I'm usually not a fan of young adult novel films, uh, like Harry Potter, Hunger Games, fucking Maze Runner. I, you start putting them in front of me and I start falling asleep. This I never got the vibe from, but now I, can, I guess I can kind of see it. Uh, I hope it's good. I hope that they fixed, I hope they used all that time of negative knowledge of negativity to fix it, but I'm probably wrong. I was like, I like Daisy's hair in this. It's very different on her, but it's kind of cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks cool. What are your, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm a bit mixed on this. Um, you know, like the, I thought the trailer was okay. I, I'll do. I, I'll tell you what. I do like the concept. You can tell it's straight out of a book, right? I mean, like the whole, the the voice, right? Which is the you know the them being them having their kind of like thoughts on display. Um, I like the idea of like kind of like a last woman on earth kind of idea. Um, I thought that was really interesting. I, this I don't know why I kind of got vibes of After Earth, which was you know the M Night Shyamalan uh. movie. Yeah, I don't know why it just felt like that a, a, a bit to me, and I hope it's I, not I because it, that I movie guess. was yeah that movie was really bad. But um, it's, look, I have faith in Doug Lyman as a director. I thought I think his his past films have been really really good, man. He did Edge of Tomorrow, you know, right? He, yeah, yeah, he did Edge that of Tomorrow, Mister and Mrs. Smith, uh, American Made was the movie with Tom Cruise that he did that I thought was really underrated. But yeah, man, like look this this trailer didn't do too much for me. I'm just gonna like. Spread out and say it, you know. Other other than other than introducing the concept, which is probably the best thing for a first trailer to do, it, it it didn't really showcase to me a lot of you know outstanding action sequences and things like that. It just seemed a little that we need to do a lot of walking. That's a good point thing to point out. Like there are no like trailer moments of like blockbustery vibes. Like there are no. It doesn't look like there's any cool action scenes or. Or stuff. We see some shots, but it's hard to tell what's going on. There is a shot towards the end, which is the only thing that got me originally kind of going, uh, which is it looks like there's some sort of like CGI creature, but we see it for a split second and we don't see it anywhere else. So I'm like, what the fuck's going on there? I'm hoping that they're hiding something and I'm, it's sound, well, the way, by the way things are sounding, it sounds like this movie won't be good, but I love this concept. So I'm, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for this film. I'm I'm holding out for the director alone. Um, I think again, Doug Lyman's 
a pretty solid director, but yeah. Let's get on to another, another trailer. Um, this is one that I added very, very late to the, I guess, agenda. Uh, this is a movie called Let Him Go. And it's a movie starring Kevin Costner and Diane Lane. And look, I know what you're thinking, right? Like, they're two very old, kind of like pre-modern era actors. Um, but this trailer kind of blew me away. Like, I saw this trailer at the start of one of the movies that I'll be reviewing a bit later. And, you know, I hadn't heard of this movie but I love the way that this trailer is kind of cut and I love the music and I love the way that it kind of ramps up the tension. Um, I love the idea of a son-in-law, right? So someone who is not related to you by blood, who has kind of essentially kidnapped your son because your daughter has, has passed away, right? So I love the, I love the idea of like getting your grandson back and then tracking down that rogue son-in-law via their family who themselves are a bunch of apparently crazy psychopaths right i mean like <laughs> there's something about that that is really really awesome to me like there is a lot of potential for story here and i really hope that this movie is awesome because diane lane and kevin costner are incredible actors and i think kevin mm. costner is just he, he is you know if you go to any movie that he did in the 90s uh probably except Waterworld, um he is outstanding uh but the this is also not the first time these two have worked together. Obviously, they were Ma and Pa Kent in Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman. But yeah, I mean, like this is this looks awesome to me, dude. And I think the trailer is really, really awesome. But um, yeah, what do you think about this? Yeah, like it's funny you mentioned that because the beginning, I'm just like, oh, okay, I'm getting Man of Steel vibes, and I probably shouldn't be. Uh, I'm gonna be honest, the trailer didn't blow me away. But I can see the story potential you're talking about. Like, I don't think this is going to be a movie that makes a lot of headlines. But you know what? Focus features. When I see that logo, I'm seeing that logo pop up. I'm noticing that logo more and more lately. And they usually don't disappoint. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I'm, I'm a little bit indifferent on this. On this, like, I'm not like static for it. But I doesn't look bad. I'm, I'm, yeah. We'll see what happens with it. I don't really have a lot to say, to be honest. Um, I do think, yeah, the concept, you got potential with that, but it's like, what are you going to do with it? We'll see. Nice. Um, so Sorry, not, not a the, really great <laughs> analysis or commentary for me today is, on that. <laughs> Sorry. We've been, we've been podcasting for two and a half years. That was... Uh, I don't, yeah, not not your finest review of a well, trailer. Well, you know, what? I, you know. It, it, it beats it beats uh it, it beats you saying, yeah, I don't care about this. Let's talk about something else. Yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> but, uh, I think you know why. I think it might have been because I saw it in a cinema for the first time, and it took me so off guard. Like you know, it was just like 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 there is a there's something that this trailer does, and it's something that the uh, the original trial, the trial of Chicago Seven trailer did, and the uh, trailer for God damn it, um, Judas and the Black Messiah did, and it's just this level of escalation, like you know, like there is kind of it starts off very slow and quiet, and then it escalates and escalates and escalates until we get to the title card. Like there is like a whole a ninety second stretch where things just escalate and there is no kind of like breathing room. And that is uh, that is totally told via the music in the trailer. Like, you know, like the visual, you could take the visuals out of it. You know, you could watch this with a black screen and just have the dialogue and the music because it's just kind of like a rising kind of like violin string. Those, and that's just, I, I love that so much. Those examples you listed, those two films have really good trailers. I did mm. not get the same feeling from this trailer. And, and, and just, I'm not saying- and simply in just, the, I'm talking like the way they were cut and stuff. But yeah, I know that, I know that trope of, you know, building it up and, and stuff. But uh, yeah. Right. I'm not, I'm not comparing the movies or the trailers. I'm, I'm comparing, I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to tell you like what that, yeah. Like what that kind of like technique of a trailer is like, yeah. you know, like the, those are just the first things that come to mind because there are trailers that, slow down in the middle and you know eventually you kind of like start to lose a bit of interest it's like eh, what are we doing with this but these mm. trailers like these kept me invested like from start to finish right yeah. i guess you could say chaos walking was one of those ones the middle slows down in terms of pace mm. uh yeah with those other two trailers you mentioned um the, the thing that stands out to me with them is like they both repeat 
a phrase. And I'm noticing that getting more and more popular trailer editing now. And I, I, I'm really big fan yeah. of that. Uh, so yeah, let's, move let's on. get to another trailer. This is our last trailer for the, I guess, episode. And we're probably not going to spend too much time on this because I doubt either of us have seen the original film. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not taking guesses, but um, I think that th- that might be the case. But Godfather Coda, the death of Michael Corleone. Have you seen Godfather Three? No. Have you? No, I haven't. I'm surprised. Uh, that is. Uh, I, that I, is the I only. Thought you would have seen. That is the only Godfather that I have not seen. I've seen the first a p- bunch of times. Mm. I've seen the second a little bit less, but I still goddamn. I mean, that movie is one of the best movies ever made. But I, I, I've always been a Godfather One person over Godfather Two. But the third one, I just, I can never find the energy to put on because <laughs> I've heard that, I've heard that it's just so disappointing. I've heard that it's just so bad. I've, I have been meaning to finish it off and watch it, you know, eventually. But my dad and I, because we watched the first two a long, long time ago for the first time ever. And, you know, we just never found, we just never found the opportunity. And like, you know, we always ended up finding something else to watch. And it was always yeah. just like, neither of us were clamoring to watch Godfather 3, you know? So I'm I'm really I'm interested to see and I will watch the the Godfather three before this comes out before I watch this because I think I uh, I think it'll be really interesting to see how uh, Francis Ford Coppola did the third the third Godfather film versus how he again like because th- he hasn't he didn't go out and shoot new things he's just editing new things into this and he's kind of like he's put in a new beginning and a new ending and. It, it, when I say new, these are things that he's shot and kind of like, kind of like replaced off not B roll but deleted footage. But this so was still footage never... shot back in the day, like these like deleted scenes putting in type thing. Is that right? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. he doesn't have these actors in that age now. Like yeah. I mean, like he just doesn't. <laughs> it's just not a thing. But um, yeah, he has kind of like rejigged the movie uh, to kind of like create kind of like a new, different feel, new, different tone. Uh, so I'm really excited to see how how it holds up and how it works and whether the I guess w- whether the kind of like zeitgeist picks it up as a movie that is better than Godfather Three, um, and I know hoping <laughs> hoping that it's as good as Godfather One and Two is a bit of a stretch, but <laughs> whether whether it's better than Godfather Three or worse than Godfather Three remains to be seen. But it's it's definitely going to be interesting to see where like how it goes. Yeah. So I'm going to say something controversial. Uh, I have not seen any of the Godfather films, even though I'm not. I'm not totally. Yeah. I'm not totally surprised. Like yeah. that's not controversial it's just, at all. Okay. Yeah. Just yeah. It's uh. It was before my you. time. I know you, Matt. I know you. So yeah. Like, just, I know I you got, don't think I, I didn't grow up in a family big on films, so a lot of the older films I had to discover myself. But I have always heard Godfather Two, one of the best films ever, and Godfather One is almost as good. And everyone says Godfather 3 is just horrible by comparison. I've gotten the vibe, and I don't know if this is correct, but the reason people don't like 3 as much is um, I think it has a lot of flashbacks or something, or it's it's like he's looking back on his legacy, so I think the drama isn't as high or something. Well, even just watching the trailer for this new one, you can see that there it doesn't have the level of nuance and depth that the first two did. Like mm. there is a lot more shootouts in this. There's a lot more kind of like aggression. Mm. You know, like there's like there's a lot more. Uh, it, it's less subtle. You know, so like it's interesting to see it from that perspective because you know Godfather two, Godfather one had all of that. Like you know, it all of the violence meant something. All of the violence was deserved um, and, and uh- well earned by the movie. Yeah, and there's like a big theme of like power play and stuff like that as well, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, like I think um, what I what I am a big fan of though is is Franken films and and seeing how films are pieced together um, differently. I love director's cuts. I love movies that fell apart due to studio stuff and seeing how they would stitch it back together. That's why I'm excited for the Snyder cut. It's not because I love Justice League. <laughs> it's because I want to see what can they build with these Lego pieces? Uh, and so I'm weirdly really interested in Godfather three for this. I will say though, judging by this trailer, uh, I don't know how good of pieces they have. Like the audio sounds, they've got a lot of reverb on it. It doesn't sound very high quality. It sounds like they've tried to improve it and it hasn't improved it 
in a way. But it's also a movie made in 1990. I yeah, mean, but like, like, you gotta- they've, they've done something to, they've added some effects on top of it. And I, I'm hoping it's just in the trailer for their sakes. But I'm, I'm just really curious, like, they've had all this time. Like, it's been a billion years. Why now? Is, it, uh, is this happening just for a, a, a cash-in? Do they just did they find one or two deleted scenes, slap it on, and then just say it's the original vision, or was this something the director wanted to do for like decades, but he couldn't get the funds, or he couldn't get access to the footage, or like was this really his intention? It's kind of like the whole George Lucas thing, you know, where like he goes, "Oh, I always meant to." Did you did you call me? I have my name. Fuck off, George. Seriously, dude, we don't want you. Okay. Oh, good callback. Uh, yeah, but yeah, like those special editions of the original trilogy. It's like, dude, you. Or you did not intend to have a fucking giant CGI monster singing here. Like, yeah. So I, I wonder, I wonder if it's like a cash grab or if it's that. And like you said, will it make the film better? Uh, that it would be very interesting to find out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I don't, I don't have that strong of an opinion on it because, you know, I like, I, I'm not dying it. to see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but again, like I said, just seeing the trailer for Godfather 3, um, you know, you can tell immediately, sorry, the, the, this, this Godfather coda, you can tell immediately that it's nowhere near as good as the first two. Like, I mean, <laughs> you, just, you can, you can absolutely tell that. But, um, look, man, that, that ties us up for the, the trailers for this episode. Let's get into a couple of reviews that I have this week. I don't think you got out to the movies this week, right? Nah, nah. It's, uh, I, I can't remember last time I had nothing to say, but I have nothing to say. Nothing to review. Well, awesome. Um, all right, well, let me get into this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not going to talk? Amazing. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Let me blubber my mouth for the next five minutes or so. Uh, um, actually, it's a, couple of, it's a couple of movies that I think will probably generate pretty good conversation from both of us, to be honest, regardless of, of the fact that only one of us has seen it. Let's get into Freaky first. So Freaky... Is a movie directed by Christopher Landon. It stars Vince Vaughn and is out right now on VOD and in cinemas. Let's get to this. Morning. Morning. That's me, Millie. Ordinary, boring Millie. I love your dress. I think I saw it at Discount Bonanza. <laughs> okay, so I was never the most popular. Homecoming's this weekend. Booker is going to be at the dance. And boys never really noticed me. Honestly, if this was a horror movie, I'd be one of the first ones to get killed. Cue the creepy dude in the mask. Like I said. (laughs) But actually, it turns out... Where am I? I didn't get killed. Oh my God, why do I sound like that? I woke up in the killer's body. So, so here's an interesting way that we could do this. Um, since I haven't seen either of these, let me let me set you up with some questions to incorporate some answers into your review. Um, with Freaky, so this is the director of Happy Death Day, right? Is it correct? Yeah, Christopher Landon. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, those films felt a bit childish. Is that a is that like something that's happening here? And just the whole concept. I think the concept's a great concept, but. What do they do? I guess it's not questions, but those are just, those are questions I would have for myself going in. It's like, what do they do with the concept? Is it that interesting? Because there's good opportunity there, I think. Um, yeah, take it away with your review. So, so, yeah, I think I think it is a good concept. I uh, I think I was on record when I said this in our, like, kind of like trailer kind of breakdown, whatever, when we did a couple months ago. Um, the body, the body switch concept has never, or rather like that I've never seen, has never really been used in a horror concept in a horror, in the horror, horror genre. Like this is something that we see a lot in comedy, right? Like we've seen Freaky Friday. We've seen the change up. I've uh, only like seen it in comedy, I would say. Right, exactly. And it's something that really lends to comedy, which is why this is kind of a hybrid, right? It's a horror comedy. Oh, um, I thought of one that's not comedy. Dragon Ball Z, no. Captain Ginyu and Goku. There you go. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. You've <laughs> lost. You've lost me. All. All of. All of the women who listen to the podcast, they've all just dried up listening to that. <laughs> yeah, but they're they're a bunch of anime nerds with massive boners now. So, fellas, you're welcome. There we go. Tentacle porn. But anyway, so. <laughs> 
Um, I, I didn't. I didn't think Happy Death Day to you and Happy Death Day the first one were childish. I think that they were. You know that that's that's. I guess that's what Christopher Landon kind of set out to make. Like he knows what he wants to make, and he makes it unapologetically in terms of like he knows his target audience. Mm. You know, like he knows he knows these are people who are who have just just turned old enough to be able to attend an R-rated film, <laughs> uh, and I'm talking I'm talking R-rated in in America, but they've just turned old enough, and you know they've got a, they've got disposable income because they're working fast food restaurant jobs, and they and they're going they're on their gonna, first date. Yeah, they're going on their first date, right? Exactly. So, this movie a hundred percent appeals to that audience, and surprisingly, I really like this movie, man. Like, this was a lot of fun. Like, okay. I had, I had had a lot of. Um, uh, I think the day that I watched it on, the night that I watched it on, um, it was a very busy day work wise. So I kind of really wanted to sit back and kick my feet up, and. There was nothing better than a movie like this to really sit back and kick your feet up to. It is something that doesn't take itself too seriously. It is something that is kind of like very lighthearted in tone. There's a lot of jokes and stuff. There's a lot of violence. It's very violent in points. Right, yeah. Um, you know, it, it, it really it appeals to, I guess, people who aren't looking for something as serious as Halloween but people who are looking for something with a bit of a lighter tone. You know, like you could, you could... You could, this doesn't have to be R, but it is. You can take, I guess, a 16 year old to see this. Like, yeah. you know, the 16 year olds will love this movie. Yeah. But um, I think the I think the performances in this were actually kind of fantastic, man. Vince Vaughn looks like he is having the time of his fucking life. Like, honestly, this is it, it's so awesome to see an actor who is so well established as Viz, Vince Vaughn to put themselves in a role and 100 percent go for it. Like, you know, like, just, just, just go for it. Like, you know, just do it. Here you are. Yeah. I think I said something, um, on our like review breakdown, whatever, but I think Vince Vaughn in this role, I could see him doing really well because he, I could see him being a mass killer. He's kind of got the body shape. He could do that, but he's also like, we, we know he can do comedy. We, we, we've seen him do drama, but like he could put all that into this role so i'm really happy to hear right. that you, you, you knocked it out of the park right exactly and and not not really a spoiler but the, the the opening kind of sequence takes place in the house um and he's kind of like stalking them and it really gave me jason vibes you know like he yeah. really looks he's got the physical kind of like the the stature for it fuck yeah um and he like vince vaughn has played a very famous you know on-screen killer before um I and heard. i'm not sure if you knew this i I don't know. I don't know if I'm about to blow your mind, but um, <laughs> did you know that Psycho was remade shot for shot in the nineties? Oh, is that him? Yes. Yeah, so he what? played Norman Bates. I didn't realize. Damn. Okay. Okay. Yes. I guess. Yeah. He's, he yeah played- I guess. I guess in a weird way, he's kind of reprising that that like type of role. Right, he played Norman Bates, and like Norman Bates is wow. nowhere near as kind of like hokey as this guy. This guy's more of a bit of a Jason character, but I love the idea of like this guy has kind of possessed this girl's body, and he can now run around in like a a, a wolf in sheep's clothing and not yeah. be caught. And for me, if you're watching it, it gives every reason for Vince Vaughn's character to want to stay in that body, but it gives every reason for the girl to want her body back because she can no longer go out in society because she, he's being hunted. He's, it's like, he, like everyone knows what he looks like, right? So, you know, it, it's it's pretty awesome, dude. It's a great concept. Had a lot of fun with it. Great sense of humor. Uh, lots of blood and gore. Um, and I think it's I think it's fantastic. I'm really surprised you haven't seen it yet. I thought you were really going to go out and see this. Uh, yeah, I, I was weeks. thinking about it. I'll probably see it soon. I didn't realize it was on VOD. Um, I think what you just pointed out is something – one of the reasons why I like hold on i just i just want to clarify that i think it's in vod in the states but i don't think it's vod here i'll go cinemas then yeah um yeah i think what you pointed out is actually what i really like about the chucky franchise like you would net like he's in a doll you would never suspect it and that gives him an advantage in a way like i find that interesting um can i ask though is there a whole situation like is there a lot of comedy of vince vaughn doing shit like jack black and jumanji where he's like Oh my god! I'm a girl. Is is that like a big part of the film? 
Uh, yeah, it is. Right. Um, yeah. I think yeah, like, and it's and it's interesting to watch that. Honestly, like, it's not played out or anything like that. It's it's really, it, it doesn't kind of get under your skin. Um, you know, there's a lot of physical acting where he's running like a girl and yeah. all that stuff. Exactly what you would expect, right? I mean, but that that comes with the that comes with the property, right? Like that comes with the the the, the genre. I mean, sorry, the the body swap genre, right? Yeah. I mean, like yeah, you're yeah, going right, to get actually, that. Yeah. Right? You, you kind of have to expect that, I guess. Yeah, I think um, yeah. just with the trailer, I I love that moment where it's like, oh, we're gonna finally get you, and then like she's like, oh, I'm like a 16 year old girl or 17 year old girl or some shit. I'm just gonna scream and say the killer's here. Like that's fucking great way of like. That using was a that. great moment in the movie. I, I like because I mean, you know, these kinds of trailers I kind of forget about as soon as I watch them. Like I'm just <laughs> like, ah, oh, okay, whatever. But um, I had did not. You, when that happens in the movie, it's just like, holy shit, that is actually really, really clever. Yeah. Like, you know, just what a move. It's an interesting twist on the on the trope because usually why are we scared? Why are we running from the killer? Because he's got a knife. But now it's like, oh, no, like you're, you're this girl trapped in this man's body and now you're going to get accused of like, I don't know, trying to murder a little girl. That's like a whole new like level to it. Like, that's pretty cool. So you call us a recommend? You're, should I watch uh, it? Yeah, should I go to the movies? <laughs> Huge recommend. I'd say go to the movies. I uh, if you if you want to ask me which one's better, Happy Happy Death Day or this, I, I don't know. I, I I actually can't. I don't know which one I can recommend. I think, but I think the fact that I thought very highly of Happy Death Day probably speaks volumes mm. because I can't choose between these two. Well, know? well, I haven't seen Happy Death Day, but I've seen Happy Death Day to you, and I fucking hated I that. Uh, that's, I yeah, hated that's that movie. Stupid. That movie is fucking yeah. terrible. All right, you've told us this say. plenty of times, but I also don't want to talk <laughs> about talk to you because you haven't seen. The, I don't know how you've not seen the first one, but you've seen the second one. Just, I got I free understand. tickets. I got free tickets, so I went. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, man. Let's get to the next movie that I watched, which is called Batman. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I've lost my influence. Maybe it's time I retired the coat. Still have it. Some kids with a deer rifle put two holes in the sleigh, one in me. All I have is a loathing for a world that's forgotten. The United States military would like to procure your services. This is a one-time deal, gentlemen. How are you, Mike? Nicole and the kids are well, I hope. Where are you? All right, so Fat Man, um, this is not a podcast starring Kevin Smith. Uh, you <laughs> you posted in the after party that you were quite surprised about this film, um, and last time we spoke about it, I was worried that this movie would try and be like a bad movie on purpose. Were my fears accurate? I actually went back and I listened to our last episode oh, or whenever shit. we talked about that. Yeah, oh, because shit. I was like. I was like, how am I going to approach this conversation with Matt? And you said, yeah, your number one gripe with this movie was that, you know, because you, you're kind of getting over the whole kind of like self-aware um, situation where movies are intentionally trying to be bad, like right? The like Sharknado be- is the sci-fi film. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You specifically brought up Sharknado. Yeah. Um, but, um, man, this was one of the biggest surprises of the year. <laughs> I'm not. I am not even kidding. I... I went there on Thursday night, so the night it opened because you know, I found myself not being able to do anything to yeah. do anything. I did, you know, I had nothing to do. There's no movies. You're you're okay. You're allowed. To, yeah. Right. And, and I went down and I went. I sat there and you know because again I had forgotten about the trailer, right? But I remember the I remember the tone of the trailer. I remember it being jokey and serious at the same time. Yeah. This movie takes the premise incredibly seriously. Like <laughs> wow. There is, okay. Like, there are jokes in this, but none of them are at the expense of the premise. At no time does it make you feel stupid for watching a movie about Santa Claus. <laughs> like, okay. It just doesn't. And and the fact that it leans so heavily into that concept makes it really compelling to watch because this is not about an evil Santa Claus, which is what I kind of gleaned from the trailer. Mel Gibson's Santa Claus, or Chris Kringle, as he's known in the movie, is incredibly likable. Bell Gibson gives one of his best performances in years. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Wow. Dude, like he is so straight faced and serious. I actually listened to a an interview with the directors, the the Nelms brothers, and 
they were like, yeah, Mel was making suggestions on the fly. Like, you know, he, he was a big, big proponent of this script. And we couldn't have absolutely couldn't have got this made without him. And, yeah, you know, his 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 wife, um, who is Santa Claus's wife, played by Marianne John Baptiste, their relationship is really, really sweet and really endearing and really heartful. And it's just like, holy shit, man. Like, this is actually really getting to me. <laughs> like, I actually really love these two together. I, I like watching them together. Um, Walton Goggins is incredible as a hitman. <laughs> like, you don't... I'm not what even kidding, dude. Like, it takes it it takes it takes so seriously. And the fact that it treats it so seriously, you forget that you're watching something so ridiculous. Like, you know, you'll forget that you're watching a movie where a kid has essentially hired a hitman to kill Santa Claus. I, I, like, I guess they are good actors. Like, and if they're it's taking not that it they're good seriously... It's, it's not that they're good actors, it's the script. The script, to me, it feels like a blacklist script. It feels like something that's been, you know, toted around in Hollywood for years and has kind of been passed on, and they don't... And people, like, directors and um, filmmakers haven't really been able to figure out a way to crack it, yeah. like, you know, and make it make it work. But I think the Nelms brothers here kind of fell into something that was really interesting in that they were like... We need to we need to take this incredibly seriously. Like there is a here's an example, right? So again, no spoilers. There is a so the fat man Santa Claus is uh, experiencing some kind of financial difficulties with his workshop, um, okay. and he's losing money. In that he's not go him and his elves are not going to be able to afford to keep going. Well, so he takes a gov. Well, before you before you go into that. That raises a question here, which is a great question. And this applies to all forms of laws of uh, the law of Christmas. How does Santa Claus turn a profit? Because they make presents and deliver them for free to children all around the world. Do they get into that? Because now I'm really curious about no. that. <laughs> no, 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 no. Dude, like, honestly, if you, if you start, like... You kind of need to kind of take it as it's presented to you. Yeah. So you need to take I it just, as it's presented to you. That just occurred to my head. I'm like... Hang on, Santa Claus is a terrible business model. How does he operate his business? I'm but sorry, go, go on. So, so he takes thing, a government this, contract, is that right? He takes a government contract and his elves are forced not to make toys anymore, but to take to make weapons for the military. And it's and I'm just like, dude, like they're treating this with the utmost seriousness. And it's and it actually it worked it really worked for me, dude. I really, really enjoy this movie. Um, I thought it was really like shot in incredibly well. There are shots in this movie that it's just like holy shit, like that looks beautiful. Mm. Um, I'm just finding out now that David Gordon Green and Danny McBride served as executive producers for the film, uh, which is interesting because they worked on uh, the Halloween remake yeah. together, which is which is pretty cool. But um, yeah, man, like uh, this is a movie that I would recommend much higher than Freaky if you are. Yeah. Uh, if you are kind of conflicted as to which two movies to go check out, it's this one. And you kind of like need to, you know, because the, the idea of this guy being Santa Claus is told to you very slowly. Things start to unravel very slowly. It's not told to you immediately that Mel Gibson is playing Santa. Like, oh, you know, okay. you start to get little clues here and it's just like, oh shit, oh shit. And then he mentions the word slay. And then it's just like, oh, okay. He's like, this guy's riding around in a sleigh. What the fuck? Okay. Right. Um, so you start to piece together all these things, right? And, and it's just, it, it really kind of makes you work for it. I, I thought it was really, really, a really unique movie. And it's it's put these these two directors, the Nelms brothers, Esham and Ian, on the map for me, the same way that the two guys who did Bad Boys 3, um, the Bilal brothers, Damn. And now on the um yeah on the map for yeah. me. So I, I remember the plot point of elves developing weapons was in the trailer, and I was like, oh okay. I thought they were going to go like a weird, edgy route with that. Um, but here's a question: How deep do they get into the lore of Christmas? Like, are we seeing Rudolph? Does he fly around in a sleigh with 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 reindeer? Are the elves like looking like? typical elves does is that christmas magic like how much like of those christmas movie shit is in here so again it's very important that the directors show show things that really fit into the world that they've created the world building in this movie is absolutely incredible because the, you can see the directors 
making creative decisions to keep you in this world. Right. You know, because once you show someone, once you, sh- once you show a flying goddamn sleigh with like, you know, being ridden, like, you know, yeah. being driven around by a goddamn reindeer, that spell is kind of broken. So you never see that. You never, you see the sleigh, right. but it's kind of like parked, right? Like do they, you see it. You don't. Do they talk about it flying? Like in this world, does the sleigh fly? The do, sleigh do does fly in the right. world. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, like it's not like a goddamn car that's shaped like a fucking yeah, sleigh. Like, like they it's haven't a, it's rebooted the Christmas franchise. No, 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 no. But I mean, like there are, I mean, but there are some things where it's just like, oh shit, because the elves have pointy ears. Right. <laughs> so it's like, all right, you know what? The, some of the stuff that you're choosing to show me is interesting, and some of it is, I'm, I'm, I'm like, why did you make that creative decision? But like again, it doesn't really break it for you because you know by that point that mm. this guy's Santa and this is Santa's workshop. And then, you know, there are other elements because everyone in the movie knows that Santa Claus exists. Yeah. Everyone. It, like there is no, you know, there is no child urban legend that Santa Claus is real and the adults know he's fake. There is none of that. Mm. It like the adults know that Santa Claus exists um and that he lives somewhere in the North Pole and Walton Goggins kind of goes on this thing where he's looking for Santa Claus. It's literally him tracking him down, like hunting him. <laughs> and it is it is awesome, dude. Uh, I think Walton Goggins is one of the best actors working today. I think this is one of his best roles working today. This is Mel Fuck. Gibson's, one of Mel Gibson's ro- best roles working today. Like there is a scene where he needs to break some news to someone, to some people, and he breaks it. In any other script, it could be, comedic but he plays it with such a straight face wow. and with so much so much seriousness that it's just like oh shit man this is legit um i think you should check this out because i really want to have a conversation with you about okay. what you think of this movie is there a lot um, of action I, I think is there, is there a lot of action in it or is it more like a slow burn the, it's more of a slow burn okay. um there is definitely action in it um uh, but it's more of a slow burn absolutely it's not the big bombastic action film that the trailer sets it up to be this might be one of the most terrible marketing situations i've ever seen in my life because this the way this movie was sold is not the movie that we got okay like it is it is a much more serious action film or drama action film yeah. than the trailer sets it up to be so one yeah. last question about fat man yes Just please. yes or no yes or no is frosty in the film no okay i'm trying to, <laughs> i'm trying to i'm trying to set in my mind like what level of the christmas mythology right right is is involved that's interesting is rudolph in the it's film very, it's it's very basic rudolph yeah. is not in the film um it, it is it is a if you know a basic understanding of what's of who santa claus is and what he does on christmas right. that's all you need to okay. know right gotcha and he's not fat he is fat okay. he's, he's fat in the movie he's got a belly okay. i mean like you know if you uh, I, I was actually listening to a like uh, sorry i mentioned earlier i was listening to a, an interview with the nelms brothers and they were like the question was put to them, like, why did you guys go with Fat Man? Because that's such a, it's such a pretty, it's, it, I like that title. Like, it's very, it kind of like punches you in the face, like, boom, Fat Man. But it doesn't tell you anything about the movie. Mm. And, like, you know, like, the original title, title was apparently The Fat Man, The Kid, and I think The Stick or The, I don't know, something they used to describe. Yeah, yeah something just that, yeah. And apparently it was kind of like, social networked to them when someone was just like, how about fat man? Just give it fat yeah. man. Cause it's nice and clean and it works dude. Like I think that, I think that title is pretty memorable to be honest. All right. Well, uh, let's wrap this bitch up um, with the MDF game. We technically don't have an MDF game this week, but we saw a poll in the after party. We think kind of works just as well. Um, yeah, it got it got some pretty good engagement, and you know this is something that we don't do too often. But I, I want to shout out Rick Gentuza, who uh, posted this in the in the after party. But the poll was um, it, the question wasn't uh, your favorite m- your favorite movie never made. I think it was your like the best movie never made. But we want to I think we want to try and keep it favorite to kind of keep in line with the MDF games. But um, give me your favorite movie never made. So this is a couple of like little clues or parameters here. These are movies that were either about to start production. You know, they full they had a full cast, they had a director, that everything was good to go, but something happened and people dropped off, or it was actually in production and something happened and they dropped off. So 
something that we we came very close to getting and it just never materialized um and and something that we kind of like look back on now and like holy shit like can you imagine if we got that yeah now, i'm pretty sure you know mine we're not gonna yeah, we're not gonna guess it too, like I we think. usually do yeah all right um, um do i holy shit oh i did vote in the thing um but I did it late because originally I read it wrong as the greatest movie ever made. And like, that's a dumb question. I'll just write the room. And then the other day I realized, oh no, it's never made. And so I deleted my answer. Did you say you'll write the in. room? <laughs> yeah. And so then I went back in and I, I, I changed my answer um, to something that was accurate. Um, but that being said, I didn't even, I'm sure if I had to think about this further, I would come up with something else where it's like some project where they changed the directors or something like that. Maybe it's, Quentin Tarantino's Star Trek. That that's that might be interesting, but uh, I that went, might still happen though. Yeah. Uh, well, I went with Tim Burton's Superman Lives uh, because I think there's there's images we saw of of um, Nicolas Cage as Superman was very interesting. The history behind it with Kevin Smith doing the flyby. I think he did the flyby script. The uh, oh, actually, I just realized now I want to change my answer because I was, I did see a documentary about this, but I just remembered one that's not on the list that I've always wanted to see. I want to see Sam Rami's, Rami's Spider-Man 4. Uh, it just occurred to me. We've seen storyboards. Mysterio was going to be in it. Um, fucking the Vulture was going to be in it as well. It looked great. And apparently I remember interviews and stuff about Sa- Sam Rami was like, or Rami was like, Rami. Rami. He was so upset with Spider Man 3 because of the studio pressure he had to deal with, um, with adding Venom in and stuff. He was really upset. And apparently his mission, his goal was I want to make a proper send off for Spider Man. I want to do a film so good that like it'll make up for three. And that's what his four was going to be. But uh, during pre production or during. Yeah, I think I already had a script. Or during the early stages, um, they decided to reboot because reboots were getting bigger. And I think that's... Oh, and also they didn't want to wait because I think he had another... It was contracted for another film. And like, well, we don't want to wait for you, so we're just going to reboot the franchise, which has turned out to be a terrible idea. As much as like those movies weren't terrible, but what it did for Spider-Man, just, you know, they, they literally quit a franchise. The Amazing Spider-Man 3 didn't get made so they could do like the Marvel reboot. So I think, yeah, well, I was going to say Superman Lives, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4, I think had potential to be maybe the best, even better than two, because his, he was so passionate about that project and he was so determined to make up for three. And yeah, unfortunately, we'll never get it. Not James Cameron's, which went to James Cameron, I think, after he was stopped doing four. I want to see him behind the wheel again for a fourth time. And your one, you chose George Miller's Justice League. Yeah, I think this was a bit of a no-brainer for me. I mean, like this was this was a. You, you have to remember the Avengers was not a thing at this time, right? I mean, like when this was happening, there was no there was no sight of the MCU, right? I mean, like the the the, the superhero landscape, superhero film landscape was very very different. Um, I think George Miller is one of the best directors working today, even at his age that he is now. I think if we if it gets announced tomorrow that you know. George Miller will direct a Justice League film. I think the world would explode. <laughs> um, but, you know, like the the idea and like how close we came to this was really interesting. Um, it's It was going to be called Justice League Mortal. Um, and there is a script out there currently. It's still, it's, it is online. There were going to be no origin stories. We were just going to go straight into it. The Justice League was actually cast. Um, Adam Brody was going to play Barry Allen, Adam Brody from the OC. Army Hammer was going to play Bruce Wayne slash Batman. Like, I mean, like that is a casting speculation that still gets, you know, thrown around today whenever they cast a new Batman, Army Hammer. Um, DJ Katrona as Superman. Oh, I can't remember who that is. Um, Megan Gale as Wonder Woman. She's an Australian um, supermodel. Santiago Cabrera as Aquaman. Common as Jon Stewart, Green Lantern. I like, love Common, that, that casting, is a great by the way. Choice. I think that's great. Right. Um, and Hugh Keys Byrne. Hugh, Hugh Keys Byrne, who played uh, the Toe Cutter and uh, Immortan Joe from um, from Fury Road, he was going to play uh, Martian Manhunter, which yeah. is pretty cool. It is scary how close that was to production. Like we've seen pictures of it and stuff. I haven't read the script, but would you like to hear something? Okay, I'm going to give the world an exclusive right now. Okay, you ready for me to drop a bombshell? 
about this film. I have seen behind the scenes concept art that has never been released to the public. I mm, okay. I met someone who was, I think they were head of a department. I'm not sure. I'm not going to say how I met them because when they showed it to me, I was like, I know I followed this project. This is not online. And they were like, oh shit. I thought it was. Since then, other stuff has come out and I still haven't seen this one picture that's out there and I'll, I'll, I'll describe it now. There was art drawn of the Batcave. And what I'll tell you is it wasn't fully colored. I don't even know if it was fucking finished, but it looked like, well, I haven't seen it online. Maybe it is now, but I remember seeing it and it reminded me like, a bit of like the Batman and Robin films, like not the same, st- like that style of design. Like they had the big computer. It was very like, I could imagine a toy set of it. And I was just like, damn, that's, that's cool. So that's my weird connection to the film. Um, but yeah, I would have loved to see it too, man. I think it was I am, really I am saying, I just, I just Googled it. I am saying some art that came out this year of army hammers, bat cave, it's oh, kind yeah. of like a wide shot. Um, you know, there's there's kind of like stalactites or stalagmites from the top. Um, there's a bridge, I'm long long as up. metal bridge, L- long as metal bridge. There's like three monitors. Yeah, I don't know. Is it colored? Maybe, but it is colored. Yeah. Oh, I see the one. I see the one. Okay, the one I saw. It was not this image. My version wasn't colored, and it was from another angle. But yeah, this looks like it, it had that big screen. I remember that really well. Cool. Although I don't remember it looking this cool. Honestly, this looks better than what I yeah. saw. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, um, yeah, look, this was this was cancelled. Um, you know, it was caused by I think uh, Australian tax credits and the Writers Guild of America strike in two thousand eight. Um, and now, painful, of course, the whole yeah, right? the whole landscape of the world has changed. Unfortunately, now we will never get this movie. Um, but hey, we got a we got the 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 the, the Snyder cut to look forward to. Yeah. Um, look, I but- feel I feel like with that film and like a lot of people talk about how it's going to be really incredible. I I question it to be honest, just because we hadn't had Dark Knight yet. Like, I guess they could have gone like a like a Spider Man Sam Raimi route, but I'm worried that they would have stayed along the Batman and Robin path. And I, I really hope not. But the, I guess the I concept so, doesn't we, look like we that. had, we had had Batman Begins by that point. Oh, you did know, we? Like, with the, like that? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I can't, okay. Then I take back everything I said. Then. So that would have yeah, two we, Batman's. We, Batman's. Yes, we'd had we'd had Batman Begins by that point, and Superman Returns by that point. Okay. So, all right. I take it back. I take it back. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm more on board for it, this film that right. never exists <laughs> comes out. Now. So, so we did. Uh, there, as we said, there was a poll for this movie, uh, for this for this particular topic. Um, I was, uh, you know what? The, I- interestingly, in a poll where George Miller's Justice League was included, I was actually surprised by the winner of this. Um, Neil Blomkamp's Alien Five was the clear winner by a, a huge landslide. Now, I followed this project pretty closely, um, mm. you know, when it was announced because I was like, holy fucking shit, Neil Blomkamp's doing goddamn Alien 5. Like, this is the director of District 9. Like, holy shit. Um, and then I remember him stepping away from that project. I remember concept art coming out of an older yeah. older Hicks and an older uh, Ripley, and it was, holy shit, looked awesome, dude. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, Ridley Scott was just like, no, my toys. Um, and then and we got it, some really disappointing projects after that. Well, project because this this actually Alien Five was announced after Prometheus. Oh right. So okay. yeah. so Alien Covenant was actually the next movie after this to come out, and it was just like God damn it, man. Um, but yeah, George Miller's Justice League was in second place. Guillermo del Toro's At the Mountain of Mad- Madness is up there as well. I don't know that one as well as Me much. Neither. But um, I've definitely heard about it. Uh, but Paul Verhoeven's Crusade, Stanley Kubrick's Napoleon Bonaparte got a got a vote in there. That dude, that fucking sounds awesome. Um, something that I actually just uh, found out very recently: um, we are getting a Napoleon movie, and the person playing Napoleon is Joaquin Phoenix, and oh. it's directed by Ridley Scott. Oh, so yeah. it's going to be the best movie ever made? Okay, cool. <laughs> it it sounds like it. And, you know, I am a I am a Ridley Scott kind of. Um, I wouldn't say hater. I go back and forth with him. I don't think he's one of the best directors out there. 
Uh, but I am I am crossing my fingers really hard for that. James Cameron Spider Man is another one that came up. That is a really interesting, really interesting idea. Um, do, do, you do you know Tim much Burns, about it? Superman lives. Do you know much? I about actually, it? I actually don't. No, hit me. So hit me with what you know. I I I'm going off memory here. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure James Cameron wants to heavily, heavily change what we know of Spider Man to be. Like I think there was a a point where he was going to look more like a spider, I think. And oh, what was it? There was, there was, there, there, I think they were going to have Vulture and I, I'm having trouble remember it, but I remember there were some really bizarre choices. I'm, I want to look it up here or you can, if you want to like list off, there's some yeah, other interesting I'll picks going. as well. I'll keep going because the next one kind of blew my mind and I've never heard of it before. The Beatles is Lord of the Rings. And I was like, whoa, just, yeah. just, just, just stop right there. I looked it up. So in the mid 1960s, the Beatles wanted to star in a Lord of the Rings film directed by Stanley Kubrick Fuck. and featuring original songs. What? That's insane. Excuse me. That's crazy. Yeah, that is wild. Um, we also have Christopher Columbus's Indiana Jones and the Monkey King. That sounds weirdly racist for some reason. Um, but Christopher Columbus would. I can see that he's got very you know childlike sensibilities. Um, I don't know how he would handle kind of like a, an action movie like that. I don't even know if I want to see uh, one not done by Steve, uh, Stephen King, Steven Spielberg. Uh, but considering that we got Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull from K Steven Spielberg and we are getting the next one from James Mangold, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what he does with the franchise. George A. Romero's Resident Evil. I mean, that's kind of like a no-brainer. Uh, no pun intended. No-brainer. Um, and Oliver Stone's Return of the Apes. I mean, Oliver Stone's an incredible director. I, I definitely would have loved to see that as well. What mm -hmm. do you got? Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking it up here, and it's not exactly as I remember it. It seems like the reason it fell apart was, like, contract issues. Uh, but, yeah, so he's the big – I remember there was, like, a big casting choice. I remember, it's, it's here now. Uh, so it was potentially – it was talked about – that Arnold Schwarzenegger would play Dr. Octopus, which is- I, I had heard this. Crazy, but like I can also see it working. Uh, but I think at another point, they're going to have Electro and Sandman as villains. It seems like they never really got anywhere concrete, but there was like a treatment done. And there's also talk here of Spider-Man joining a master race of mutants. So make of that with what you will. But it's not it's not that yeah. far from what we might get. I mean, if we are X Men, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I I do, do want to point out um, something that's listed on this list that I did not know existed, which blows my mind. George A. Romero's Resident Evil that mm. would have been interesting. Like the the zombie king himself directing a Resident Evil film that sounds a lot better than what the fuck we got. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The the one that blew my mind actually in the comments by Eric Mason, um, and, and you know everyone knows about this. We're not going to talk about this anymore. But uh, Edgar Wright's Ant Man, right? I mean, oh, like there yeah. are shades, there are, there are shades of Edgar Wright in that original first um, Ant Man um, because he was kind of kicked off or but he left the project. So um, that would yeah, have been was, really was, interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but man, that's, that's this week's MDF game. Thanks for giving us the inspiration, Rick, because we were very unprepared for this week's show. Uh, th this is becoming a theme with us. We're, uh, we're continually at the last minute forgetting about MDF games. Not that they're not important to us, but they generate, they generate great conversations. It's just that we, we just never <laughs> get to talk yeah. about them pre-show, um, which is kind of like why we forget about them. But guys. Uh, Matt, do you have anything else to say before we head out of here? Um, Maybe you just want to plug uh, the, the shit and close us out. Yeah, let's just, let's just plug the socials. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. We love you very much. Please follow us on the socials, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. Please check out midnightdoublefeature.com, buy some merch and look as fresh as us. And if you really want to support the show, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash midnightdoublefeature. Did I get that right? Yeah. I want to say I got you that tell right. me if you got that right. I don't fucking. You tell know. me if you got that. You know right. what, listeners? <laughs> you tell me if we got that right. And yeah, the green it's room. In the, it's in the show notes. Yeah, it's and, in the show notes. And you can um and you can hear exclusive episodes uh that are only for you guys, including 
uh, feature presentations of the mummy. And did we do, we did, was it the reservoir dogs? Was it reservoir dogs we did recently? Yeah, we did do reservoir dogs recently, but it has yet to be released. It's going to be released next week. So, yeah, so there you go. There's a teaser guys. Um, and also, yeah, lots of other cool conversations. You and me did one about Batman games and yeah. Anyways, thank you very much for joining us. I'm Matt. That's Zoe. Do you have anything else to plug before we go? Uh, no. All right. Then we <laughs> love you. Ver- we love you very much. Have a wonderful day and, you know, give your friend a hug for me. I'm Matt at Zoheb. Laters. Laters.